The following is a three hour conversation with very close affiliates and team members of the Elephant Money Project. How did this conversation start? It all started off because of a recent video I've published on Elephant Money. A very critical video, a video where I compared Elephant Money with Ponzi schemes. If you haven't watched that video yet, now is the time. Link is down below. If you're already invested in Elephant Money or you plan to deploy significant capital in this project, you want to do your research, right? You should have the time to watch three hours of critical questions with the team. Now, there are some very juiceful bits in here. For example, BT, Bank Teller, compared Elephant Money with the perfect mousetrap and trying to build the perfect mousetrap, if you will. Now, if you are the mouse in a perfect mousetrap, you want to be this mouse here. Elephant Money is a very complex system. Apparently, 51 smart contracts are involved. You've got NFTs, you've got a staking program called Futures, you've got the whale called Bertha, you've got a buy and sell tax on the elephant token itself, You've got a graveyard, you've got all kinds of complex instruments here and a price that on a daily chart at least seems to never go down. Um, what do whales do when Bitcoin drops? They buy. Yeah, um, but, especially but hex, hex people didn't buy, right? So I'm now playing devil's advocate. Yeah, because it's a shit coin. How can something appreciate one, two, three percent every day and rarely see a negative day? Grab some popcorn, grab a beer. Here are three hours of hard grilling of the Elephant Money team. So, um, hey man, for one, thank you for the YouTube uh, coverage that you did. And uh, much like anyone who looks at it for the first time, they see, you know, a chart like this and they just go, oh my gosh, okay, yeah, okay, it's a pump, it's a pump, but one's a dump. And, uh, you know, really with this protocol, you're looking at uh, a two and a half year uh, protocol that came out on May 4th of 2021. It's already gone parabolic once before until it suffered a $331 million flash loan attack. Um, it's important to note that this was not uh, administratively, it didn't breach anything on the contract. It was a, a matter of this elephant treasury. Oh, man, this didn't load. But this elephant treasury right here had direct front and backdoor access for that flash loan to lopside the pools, uh, cycle a bunch of things in one block and then basically extracted out this entire value. And here we are um, a year and a half later since that attack. And, you know, everything is so much better now and more efficient, more optimized um, for this entire ecosystem. So, yeah, yeah, I don't want you to get scared by the $566 million uh, market cap because in my opinion, non-financial non advice, but I think that this is still really early. And um, what this is aiming to be, honestly, is the first global decentralized community bank of its kind, where, um, you know, right now, at least I live in America, but if I were to put my money into savings, you know, I'm battling against 7% inflation. So my $100 turns into $93 at the end of a year. And, you know, this is aiming to just be that place where you take your real world profits or maybe your other crypto project profits and store it here in arguably um, the strongest uh, store of value out there in, in DeFi. All right. So, okay, let's talk about the basics of how this works, right? So the first thing you do as a regular user without getting too much into all these side projects like NFTs, right? when you just look at the main thing that drives yeah. most of the activity, the first thing people would do is when they see this chart and they have bought into it, which I haven't yet, obviously, um, they, they buy into this, they pay a tax, right? You've got these yes. four issues at the bottom right uh, when you go to DEX screener. So the page you've just looked at, you oh, go there. Yeah, right here. Um, at the bottom right, you've got these issues exactly. And that shows you, okay, you've got a buy tax 10%, you've got a sell tax of 10%, you've also got a whitelist, okay, but anyways. So you pay 10% tax. Where does that money go to? And does the buy and the sell tax go to the same places? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So I'm going to pull this up as well, just to kind of help me 
Um, but essentially, you're right. There is an inherent 10% in and out fee that is collected. Um, half of that fee uh, comes in and immediately goes over to this BNB LP on this pie chart that I'm showing. So half mm -hmm. of it immediately goes into liquidity. Now, the other half of it actually gets reflected. It's a reflect token, and it goes out to all the holders of this platform. So um, this Bertha right here, this elephant treasury, we'll talk about that's a holder. The participants, all of us humans that are in it, we're holders. And also this graveyard. So, you know, think of like Safe Moon, but they used to just have a null address. They would just burn these tokens and send it to oblivion. But here, the graveyard is actually an active participant. It is a smart contract that always holds 50% of the supply. And then through reflections over time, it builds up to 51%, which is a spread of 10 trillion tokens. And then it rebalances back down to 50%. And what does it do with those 10 trillion tokens? Well, it actually, um, it converts some of them into uh, BNB. And then it is paired with the remaining 5 trillion tokens. Um, and then locked into this BNB LP right here. Yeah. So that's some of the token. Here's an image, actually. The last time we went parabolic in March of 2022, this red candle was a graveyard rebalance. So of the 10 trillion token spread I mentioned, 5 trillion were turned into BNB, which is what this looks like right here on the chart when we're going parabolic, and then paired with the 5 trillion remaining tokens then put into, uh, where is it at? Locked liquidity down here. So you have $92.5 million in locked liquidity across the Elephant BNB and BUSD pairs. Um, and here's the graveyard percentage. Right now we're at 50.5%, and eventually this will hit 51. It'll rebalance, lock it into liquidity, and the cycle just repeats in perpetuity. In so, other words, if you wanted to time this perfectly as a new investor, you don't want to be part of that red candle, you'd wait until we've just hit close to 51 and then the rebalance happens and then you buy. Correct. If you're coming in at that time frame, um, right now, this is hard to predict when this is going to rebalance again, because this can be spread out over, you know, several months apart. You know, it takes a while for those reflections to build up in the volume, right? So I wouldn't wait for the graveyard, but because the community knows how this works, they anticipate, hey, one day I have my elephant holdings. Oh man, this graveyard's about to rebalance. Everybody get your BNB, get your BNB ready. Let's go, let's go. And this is so, a four hour um, candle. When did this happen last time? This was in middle of March, right? So like seven months yeah, ago. Yeah, this happened over a year ago. Yeah, it hasn't happened since then. Um, uh, over a year ago then, yeah. It's, it's, okay. Yeah, oh, but but see, okay, um, it's more nuanced than that, but it's because inherently there's the 10% fee that we talked about. But right now, and what I would encourage you to do is um, you can actually uh, link up to an upline, right? This is very modest rewards. Like I'm talking half a percent goes up to the upline. None of this like 15 tree level down crap. But what, what you, if you have an upline partner, and then you buy the token on the website, you actually get a discount. So instead of paying 10% fee, you will only pay 8.5% fee. And the lion's share of that fee, you'll see half a percent goes to my upline. And the other 8% goes to Bertha. So yeah. we're actually bypassing at the moment, we are bypassing uh, the graveyard because when we had that flash loan attack, um, Bertha is this uh, red that's growing. And when the flash loan occurred, you can see how the red disappeared, right? It's gone. And mm -hmm. we've spent the last year and a half rebuilding the elephant treasury Bertha in red. So now we're having the lion's share of taxes go directly into rebuilding her because she got attacked over a year ago. Yeah. Okay. So basically this upline, the, this upline system is a uh, referral to be completely like, like to call it in, in regular terms, right? It's kind of like an affiliate yeah. slash referral program. It is. Trying it to is. get more people yes. in. Yes. Okay. 
And it's um, not required. You can obviously buy this on PancakeSwap and pay the 10% tax. But if you want to buy it on the website, yeah, you can get a discount. And uh, they're like, so for every $1,000 someone spends, you will see $5, right? It's very sustainable, mm -hmm. very modest. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, can we go back to the uh, tax pie chart that you just said before? Where it says yes, where sir. things go. Okay. Yes. Um, so 10% get paid, get, get taken away from, let's say, the rep BNB. And you say um, some money of this, for example, goes into Bertha, right? In the, to this treasury that currently holds these 100 million worth of uh, tokens, of elephant yes. tokens. Now, what happens here exactly? Because we, the rep BNB gets pulled out of that transaction, but in the end, Bertha holds elephant tokens so does that mean yes. that that parts of these to that, that in the buying transaction parts of the tokens get transferred into elephant tokens and then moved over there or what happens there because there's no, no B um, there's no rep bnb stored in bertha right 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 um her value is reported off of the bnb lp but she only holds elephant token like she so she's no different than the participants you see right here so sure. she's exactly the same thing the difference is she's just a protocol designed whale who's not going to dump on you um so here i'll actually play this chart so this is since may 1st of last year and you'll see the token distribution like 500 already locked up 500 trillion in the graveyard but look at the remaining 500 trillion how it moves around and look at Bertha's growth, okay? This, I'm going to play that back. This is really interesting because the bigger she gets and the more we shrink these LPs, that's how you get that parabolic price action that we see right now. So, you know, uh, imagine this. You know, if I were to ask you to go buy Pepe or Dogecoin or Bitcoin or Ethereum, you, you really don't know who the whales are, right? You have all these people that were in earlier and they have bigger bags than you and you're at their whim and mercy if they were to sell, you know, on and dump on your head and leave you holding the bag. But what Elephant strives to do is actually with the 10% in and out fee collected, it's all about value capture and taking that economic energy and channeling it into a protocol that is not only triple audited, not only have, has it survived a $331 million flash loan, so it's battle tested, but it's locked down in the protocol. So when you add Bertha, this elephant treasury Bertha, plus the graveyard, you see that it owns the lion's share of, of the tokens. So you don't have to worry like you do on a, on a meme coin, Pepe, which, you know, someone can dump and leave you holding the bag. In elephant, you have a friendly whale named Bertha. Remember, that this whale is literally the same as this elephant treasury. She's just so important. We named her Bertha, right? The founder named her Bertha. Um, but she is selfless, and she does not dump on your head. The only time she dumped is when this exploit right here occurred. So that whale dumped on you. All those tokens... Um, these are the LPs, by the way, the LP tokens, as we buy, we're shrinking the LPs in blue, but all those tokens that she gobbled up now got relinquished back into the wild. That's why the blue jumped up. And then here we are a year and a half later, we've now successfully again, reached the point where the elephant treasury Bertha in red has crossed the size of how many tokens remain in the LPs. And just like last time, Look at when the red and the blue crossed last time right here, where my uh, yellow cursor is. We went parabolic on the price, okay? And that lightning in a bottle is what, it was kind of like an aha light bulb moment for the founder. He said, oh my gosh, I may have just cracked DeFi because we have deep liquidity. We have scarcity on a token. There's a finite supply of one quadrillion tokens. And now we only have... 82 trillion tokens left available on the market that when it shrinks underneath the size of Bertha, the price go up. Look at how this went parabolic before. And I'm just using the past to predict what I mathematically should happen in the future because we're repeating history, except this time everything's fortified. 
uh, around Bertha. She cannot dump on you again. So this theoretically should keep going up. And no matter how many people profit take, we've already been through the ultimate stress test. Or if, if you were in the chat a year and a half ago, you would have just seen all the FUD, all the people selling, all the haters. Every dude, We've been through that. And here we are a year and a half later, everybody's flocking back to us because we're doing it again. But this time we're more fortified than ever before. And that's why you have a chart like this. The largest human holder, I'll remind you. Oh, I said it uh, in the chat earlier, but the largest human holder, fifth place right here, this person only holds 0.8. 2% of the entire supply. Everybody underneath them has less than half a percent. And all of these trillion token holders that you see on my screen right now, they largely didn't even sell on the day of the flash loan a year ago. Once they learned administratively, the protocol was fine. Once they learned we didn't need a version two and the founder didn't give up, they largely aped in more tokens like they bought more so you have believers of this protocol that are really holding this down and they have no reason to really dump their entire bag because of the other aspects of the ecosystem that we can talk about later on but you, yeah. you have a really strong community here yeah. all right um i was so so first of all it's interesting i i looked at the same time at some um Technicals. I'm not sure how to share my screen. Can I can I share this quickly? I want to show you something. Yeah, I think so. Um, how do I? Share maybe I have screen. to stop my screen share. Screens. This one. Let's screen. see. Go live. All right. You can see my screen, I guess. Can you? Uh, once. Second, yeah, I click on watch stream. Yes, I see it. Top. Okay, so I um, just looked at Dex Screener for Elephant Money and looked at the um, at some transactions. Got like one yes. buy transaction over here, and then looked at where the money is flowing. So this transaction is just a random transaction I picked. Um, came from this wallet ending one DF, and uh, this guy gets back. For these, uh, what are the 21 rep BNB, gets these seven, what are we talking about? Billions? Yeah. Seven billion tokens back minus fees, right? Those two seem to be fees. So these go then, these other two go to these other two addresses. Okay. One of those yes. addresses is Bertha. Yes. Okay. So that is the, um, B4FC address, this one. This is Bertha, part of the buying tax. Yes. There's another transaction, um, DB, this thingy, right? So it goes to this wallet. That's this one over here. Now I tried to find this wallet in the overview of wallets that has oh, been sent in the is. Telegram. Oh, you know what it is, yeah. great. Okay. Yeah, so l l look at the transaction one more time. And just, yeah. it's a little bit blurry for me, but confirm the amount of elephant token going to that wallet is very small, right? Like very minimal. Yeah, comparatively, comparatively small, correct. Yeah. Okay. So that is an upline. Remember how I told you ah, um, okay. half percent goes up to a random upline. So that's a random person. We don't know who that is, okay. but this purchaser is connected to that person. Yes. Ah, nice. Okay, great. Let's see if you can find, let's take a sales transaction. Yeah, just the recent yes. one. Let's see if you can understand where money is flowing. So, um, originating from EA20, getting back BUSD. Uh, wait. Trying to understand this. Hmm. Okay, so he sold. Got uh, 6,210 BUSD back. Um, but what is that transaction then? Rep BNB. He sold, he's, this is the liquidity pool against Rep BNB, right? Yeah, this is the Rep BNB liquidity pool. But they so, turned it into BUSD. Yeah, who is the they? 
This is so, a this is an interesting transaction, right? So yeah, maybe they maybe they sold it on a place like PooCoin and chose to sell it against the no no because you're looking at the BNB pool, not the BNB. Yeah, I looked pool. at I, I looked at the wrapped BNB pool, took the latest transaction, um, originating from this apparently random person. Interacted probably with the with the regular pool, right? So click on the person that sold it. Is it random though, or is it part of the contract? Because remember, um, I, Bertha. I, I picked Bertha, something random. I don't know if oh. it is a random person. Okay, well, I guess. But, if just I were trying to, to understand the flows. Thing. So, so, so the reason why I yeah. want to try to understand these flows is to then, for example, see. Okay, these are regular transactions. Here's so so. Okay, maybe I give you a bit of a, a parallel that I had with. Hort. So this is how I analyzed yes. Hort, and this is how I was able to not be late, but be early in this. Um, with Hort, you had similar kinds of transactions, and you could see, okay, parts of this went to, I think they call it the Hort pool. And then with that Hort pool was some other related wallet that was, um, uh, that was responsible for keeping the pack, right? This $100 pack, I don't know if you remember this. But there was I this one remember. token yeah. that was that was packed to a fixed price, and so um, we could then see uh, how much money was in that particular place, in measured in BUSD, not measured in the native token. Uh, how much BUSD value was there? Um, that, and how did this balance evolve over time relative to how much money was required to stabilize the price? And so that way we could mm -hmm. see, okay, this is how much money is currently used to stabilize the price. This is how much money that's currently flowing in. This is how stable the system is overall and uh, how likely it will survive for the next X, Y, Z months. And I'm trying to figure out something in a similar fashion here, trying to see, because... Obviously, this price is not just bias, right? There is something going on in the background that makes purchases in a yes. at a different point in time. Yes. Right? A, a lot of it is Bertha buying. Uh, Bertha herself. Yeah. So then the question is, with what is... No. Yeah, okay. So then there's, there's several types of bias then, right? Because yes. when, when, you buy, when you buy the token itself, tokens get transferred to Burfa elephant money tokens, but Burfa doesn't hold wrap BNB or anything, right? So it can't really prop up the price with the elephant token balance. So there needs to be a balance denominated in something else than elephant tokens, where the purchases are happening outside of regular people buying. Yes. So... Um, yeah, yeah, I think I know where to go with that. Let me pull up a screen share one more time. And okay. also just understand like the random person that you found on the purchase and we saw the upline. Um, just understand too that that works on the reverse. If people were to sell on the website, it would uh, be the exact reverse. So the upline would see half a percent of the sell mm -hmm. and then Bertha would 8% of the sell and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um so there, there are a number of different avenues that are happening in the background. So there, there, there are over 51 contracts in this entire ecosystem mm -hmm. um, that, that's happening. And yeah, I'm not um, trying to attempt to understand the flow of each of one of them. I try to understand right. the main, the, the, yeah, right, the main, the main value. value. The main yeah. yeah. So um, I'll, I'll just give you an overarching view too. So when we look at the elephant token you'll see with the two pairs uh wrap bnb and also busd you'll see how price wise they are very similar okay and that is another function a major function that bertha does uh, to keep these prices in parity so you don't have like a huge arbitrage between the two right um that's largely happening because also when you buy with bertha right here when you put in bnb this will actually purchase on the cheaper of the two pools so just a heads up there this mm -hmm. might convert your bnb into busd and purchase on the cheaper pool right mm -hmm. so just just understand that happens in the background um but 
overall, what you're what you're talking about is where are all these buys coming from? If it's not just human people, where are the buys coming from? Mm -hmm. And so one example is actually here with futures. Whenever people deposit, uh, that's that graphic I gave you over here. Money would come into this BUSD treasury. It would then in the background purchase elephant token and then put it into the treasury. So that's one avenue. Uh, you've also got the unlimited NFTs right here. So if I pull this up. Yeah, the these... BUSD treasury, I think I've seen. That's like, what, 300K? Let me check. It's at 143K right now. 400, yeah, right. 143K yeah. of BUSD. Yes, yes, that sounds right. Because every day, uh, up to 50% of this BUSD treasury comes out. So like, like th this is a snapshot from tw uh, three months ago. But in a 24-hour period, 50% would have come out of this. So this would actually read uh, 200 and, uh, 255. Uh, so it kind of takes left. the current balance, what, whatever has been yes. bought. Um, so this comes what, from the NFTs? Or where does, uh, does this fill up? So this one specifically, without going into the detail, this is from... Oh, I didn't open it. This is from Futures. Uh, from like the and staking product kind of right it's a staking product that's all it is yeah and you can see i have forty four thousand busd locked in this i cannot take this out but i am earning half a percent a day on it and i can how interact long? with my interest for how long is this uh, locked? no just it's just in perpetuity locked you cannot take this out but you can interact with the interest you earn i can claim oh. or i can compound in my interest so it's actually not that's really all. staking it's almost like the hot model you you it's put like, in the money. Yes. Yes. yes and in yeah. perpetu okay, so this runs then in perpetuity. Okay. So you get half a percent out. So you're basically betting, quote unquote, that um is your is your um principal compounding? Or is so, the principal okay. fixed? So uh, would you basically would you be break even in uh two hundred 200 days? days? Okay. Yes, you would. Yes. Yes. Understood. But but here's the caveat. In two hundred days, my available will read. 44,000. And if mm -hmm. I claim it, it I will get my 44,000 back. No taxes in and out of this. But when you claim, it do does deduct from your value. So if I claim out 44,000 in 200 days, I will zero out my whole balance and I will be done with this contract, basically. But you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I mean, I don't want to teach you this unless you want to know, but uh, I, I just want to give you the overarching. No, it's so, good to so understand. It's good to understand. Okay, okay. so basically well, you would you need a minimum of 200 days to be break even. If you would hold it for 400 days, you would double your money. Well, and once no, you claim it's, it's done, more nuance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's more nuanced than that. So I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can since this has yeah. your interest. So yeah. there's a minimum. Have, have, did you participate in a uh, drip by, uh, by chance? Uh, I did not. I had a quick look at it, but I didn't look at the tokenomics yeah. too deeply. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to make sure this this trashes all over that that model. But um, okay, here here's what happens: you actually don't want to wait 200 days and pull it all out because why? You're just breaking even, and you want to use this as a cash flow model. So check this out. I'm going. I'm in build mode. This is what I call build mode. I'm gonna bring a, a calculator. So every day I'm earning half a percent on this amount. And when I want to, I have to put in a minimum deposit of 200 BUSD. So this would go up, you know, to 44.3 if I add 200. And it will also roll in my reward with it. So this will actually go up 200 plus my 215. Okay, mm -hmm. it'll roll in. Now, I'm going to fast forward to what I want this to say. One day, I actually want to build this up to say 100,000 BUSD. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to switch to a three weeks worth of building and one week worth of claim. So here's what happens. Now I'm earning half a percent a day on 100000 which is $500 a day. Now, at the end of one week, so time seven, I'm going to pull out $3,500. So when I claim out $3,500, it will, remember when I said I claim, it deducts from my balance. So this minus 3,500 now becomes $96,500. Now follow me. Cool. I just pocketed $3,500. But now I want to build for three weeks. So 
So now I'm earning half a percent a day on, oh, I can't math, half a percent a day on 96 and a half thousand. So instead of 500 a day, now I'm only earning 482, remember, but I'm building this over three weeks. So that's 21 days, right? So now after three weeks, my available interest will say $10,000. Now I have two choices. I could either claim that out. And if I did, 96 and a half thousand would subtract out 10 more thousand, right? So I'll only have like 85,000, but I want to build. So I'm going to add in $200 minimum deposit. It is then going to compound on top of my 96 and a half thousand. So now remember, I started at a total balance of 100,000. I dinged it down to 96 and a half. And then after three weeks, I put it back higher at 106,000. Now I'm earning half a percent a day on this. So remember, originally I was earning 500 a day. Now I'm earning 534 a day, this time seven days. Now my claim week isn't 3,500 like the first month. Now I'm taking out 3,700. You see? Mm -hmm. And then when I rinse and repeat that three to one cycle, the next month I'll pull out 4,000. And then the next month after that, 4,400. So I've established a monthly income that's ever increasing with time and everything is solvent because it's paid for by Bertha. You saw this in the chat earlier, right? So like when this money comes in, remember it buys and gives the treasury 2.5 trillion tokens. But when the treasury owes back $518,000, it doesn't sell the same 2.5 trillion tokens. It sells less tokens to meet your dollar obligation. She's only going to sell maybe 200 billion, maybe, maybe 500 billion tokens. It'll be a far cry from the 2.5 trillion that she received. And that's evident by here. This is blockchain data. As Bertha's token count goes up, her dollar value goes up, right? And, and the last thing before you ask a question right here, I'm gonna show you. Look at the elephant treasury right here. And I'm gonna, you know, again, this was three months ago. Do You see the difference? She had 144 trillion tokens three months ago, and it was valued at $24.5 million. You see this right here. But now she has more tokens, and she has seen explosive growth. She's up to 90, almost $99 million right now. So this, this is another representation of that. Her token count goes up, the dollar value goes up exponentially more. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. So how did we come to all of this? We took, looked at the um, tax, the, the buy and sell tax and part of it goes to the treasury because it gets directly yes. converted yes. um the other part went to the referral yes um and then we arrived at the staking program because this is where the busd treasury is we are looking at where do we have treasuries that are not native tokens busd treasury yes. is coming from this do yes. we have any other kinds of treasuries? Revenue? Yes. Where, um, so basically pockets of stored value besides this BUSD treasury that are not elephant tokens or trust yeah. tokens. So, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would so, so far I have 100, so far I have 140K from this BUSD treasury. But what I'm looking for is kind of like a wallet that has... So, so I tell you why I need why why I'm thinking about that specific amount. I ideally want to see a wallet that has Rep BNB or BUSD or anything like this in the size of roughly three million uh, worth of dollars. And the reason why is because um, when you go to one inch and you want to know how much money does it need to create. A price impact currently with the current liquidity pool size, a price impact mm. of twenty percent on the price, which would be equal to the buy and sell tax. Mm. Uh, you need roughly three million. 
that would then in turn mean that if you currently, if you would find a wallet like this, this uh, that also interacts with stabilizing the price, that would mean that if you're now getting into elephant money with the 10% buy tax and 10% sell tax, that you wouldn't have to worry too much about that tax because there's already the that specific amount of value in the protocol that is actively being used to stabilize the price for those 20 percent so you're actually not really paying the 20 percent because the 20 percent will be used uh, because th that amount of value will be used to stabilize the price that's the kind of thing i want to get at this is the kind of um analysis i did with prior projects and why i went into them because i saw I think I understand. yeah you understand the the, the reason so the, the problem is you buy you get in and out of the thing you're down 20 percent now the question is is there enough value in the protocol to support an increase that makes up for that being down 20 percent and that I, that yeah and that's equal to 3 million according to my analysis roughly and so I'd like to see a wallet that is being used to prop up the price that is worth 3 million that is denominated in BUSD or Red BNB. That's my ideal scenario. You understand? I understand. Yes. Um, so I, I don't think you're going to find... So this is a, For one, there's not a wallet that has $3 million like that because this doesn't work like Horde. Um, but let me see if I can round out some details for you, though. Um, so understand, let, let's look at CoinGecko real quick. And just just know, if anyone's on the fence about buying and there's a 10% uh, fee collected, well, I mean, you look at the, the categories, you know, and we're, we're green in all of them. So look, in 24 hours. Yeah, but I mean, you can say, so, so, so I try to be, I try to be here the, the, the devil's advocate, right? Because... Um, I'm I'm the most critical person, and if you conv can convince me, then you can probably convince anybody else as well. Um, so I try to be also yeah. uh, um, a as critical no, as no. possible. So I, so when no, when we look I at, for example, these kind of arguments, like okay, it's green and it's up only. You could also say the same thing for hot. It's a stable price. It never defects, and then one day, boom, it implodes. All right. So that's a problem. The the I I am cautious. Problem with four. Yeah, I, I'm yes. cautious. I'm okay. I say this way i'm cautious with arguments that you could also make with a ponzi scheme i know your words you say it's not a ponzi scheme but the argument you're presenting here for example with the screen numbers or with the growth you could also make that with a ponzi scheme so what i'm looking for are arguments that um convince uh, either of course it's not a ponzi scheme but it's very hard to convince because you could call a lot of things ponzi schemes what I'm yes. at least looking for is that whatever this is, it is stable enough that people are not going to freak out in two weeks. Correct. And for, ex for example, that kind of, because let's say, this, let's say I'm the most critical person on the planet, right? And I buy into this with the expectation to make, say, 20% profit. And I'm mm -hmm. down 20% when I buy it. So I need to have this thing survive for at least three to four weeks. Now, what Correct. kind of data points do I have as the most critical person that this thing survives three to four weeks? And having, for example, a wallet with, with all of that value in would be one of those data points. But I'm open to other data points. But past price growth is not such a data point. You understand what I mean? Yes, no, no, I, I understand. And um, also what's really cool is the founder just joined. So, you know, he can oh, nice. chime in here in a second. But, um, but so, so to answer that, I'm just showing the price point because of what I've explained in the past, really with this token called uh, token count, this is what's driving the supply, demand, the scarcity, right? And the value is really being locked in the LPs. I think the wallet you're looking for, like the $3 million wallet, like Horde would have really rests in the LPs. It's all about the value capture that, oh man, I can't find mine. Yeah, it's but but, but when something is in an LP, you can't really you can't really support the price with LP money, right? LP money no. is just liquidity money. No, you you can because you can you can sell against Bertha can sell. So when one of the pools goes up in value, okay, let's say BNB does a, a huge run, 
and it's up 50% in a day. Well, when that happens and it separates away from the BUSD LP pair, Bertha can step in and actually arbitrage. She will sell, she will sell the BNB LP down with no tax collected. She's whitelisted. And then she will put that value into the BUSD. Does that make sense? So yeah. she's market making between the LPs. Now, yeah, that's arbitrage also, profit, but that's, yeah, it's not. It is, um, but, it's, it's, but it's harnessed and not leaving the system. It's trapped in the system. Now, also remember, besides the futures deposits that we said are buying Elephant Token for Bertha, remember these, these NFTs are here too. There's a whole slew of menu items that are, uh, you know, providing buybacks on the Elephant Token. So like right now, an NFT costs 2 BNB. So if somebody were to mint 50 of these in bulk, well, that is 50 separate 2 BNB purchases on Elephant Token that actually go into Bertha, specifically Bertha. She's holding the token and, and supporting the, the price. Remember, she is a holder that doesn't dump on you. That inherently bolsters the price. Yeah, but, but, but you know, so, so, so that's the thing um, I talked about with this chart, right? The price chart. The price chart, so it, from my perspective, implies that there are purchases that are decoupled from regular human buying, right? Because, so, because otherwise it wouldn't be as consistent. If this is just right, true, right? so there is, that, there is a mechanism. The that's the, yeah, yeah, that's that, what, what sells these 50%. Is, do, you to, do you want me to step in and address that? Yes. Hey, bank teller, go ahead. Uh, meet my friend, uh, introduce yourself, uh, Gerhard. Uh, by the way, I'm recording for everybody who's uh, jumping in, just that, you know, I'm recording. I will not like publish the whole thing, but I might publish certain excerpts. Um, yeah, that's fine. And, and I try to be also as uh, critical as possible. Because, right, if you can convince me, you can convince others. Uh, you've seen my, yep. my, my video. Okay. Yeah, I saw the video. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just, just, just in general, you know, just to give you some grace, you know, um, the reality is a lot of us have been in the space for a long time. You know, we're used to things working a certain kind of way. Um, you know, as a as a fintech professional with over 30 years of experience if you if you if you count my institutional experience at state street and fidelity uh i've been i've been basically doing this stuff since i was in my early 20s you know i'm almost 50 years old now uh i sound a lot younger than i am and when i dye my beard you know my girlfriend likes that so no anyway uh but uh uh, six. You know, I, I was in Bitcoin in 2011. You know, I, I met Eric Voorhees, Roger Veer. Um, you know, at the Bitcoin 2011 uh, international conference in New York City, and you know, we stayed up all night just talking about the possibilities of this space. Um, unfortunately, uh, I dipped out. I dipped out of the space. I was making around, you know, you know, a couple six figures at State Street at the time, doing stuff in global markets uh, for for foreign exchange for, for FX Connect, which does trillions, you know, just trillions of volumes a week. Um, still, is still running on the same code base that I built, you know, over you know decades ago now. Uh, but anyway, long story short is uh, when I got back into this after kind of leaving the industry for a while. You know, I tried to get into cosmetics, lost my shirt, had to, you know, had to basically, you know, go back to the drawing board and say, hey, let me do what I'm good at. Um, so I started building community and uh, DeFi protocols on Ethereum, Tron, BSC. You know, basically, it became very apparent that the uh, gas fees on Ethereum just would not work. Because uh, I was I was chasing utility and specifically trying to solve the problem of uh, of cash flow for all. And what I mean by that is basically we're just trying to create uh, systems that can capture value, create passive income, you know, standard banking system like that. Um, you know, because I know, um, you know, you know working in personal investing at Fidelity, for example, you know, just seeing all, all manner of 
customer facing um, solutions for managing retirement funds and things like that. So, um, you know, basically I've been trying to crack the code on uh, on chain annuity contract for a long time. And so you see that. And so to specifically answer your question about, well, where's all these, you know, the, the, the chart shows a consistency that's not uh, representative of natural buyers of the token. And you're absolutely correct. Um, basically, you have to zoom all the way out. People get too caught up in the chart and the token, and they forget what elephant money actually is. Elephant money is a decentralized community bank. We have front-facing products, which are completely price insensitive to the value of elephant which means that in a two-sided uh, marketplace, which is what it technically is, they are buyers of last resort. As a matter of fact, they're just, they, uh, that front, those front-facing yield products, we sell yield, uh, you know, if you use, a ham, use the hamburger analogy, um, the yield is the product that people are, are purchasing, whether they're purchasing it through the NFTs, uh, where in the NFTs are, you know, my favorite part of the system, uh, which was this is the, the, the latest part of the system, um, because the NFTs ha create a completely separate uh, and natural secondary marketplace uh, where uh, after you mint an NFT, right, 100 percent of those 100 percent of the, those pro uh, proceeds go directly to buybacks for elephant. Uh, and in and and then and then that goes into the treasury, right? So it, it increases the price. It increases the price of all the tokens that are in the treasury. So that's that multi multiplicative effect. Um, you know, just like uh, I think you know, yeah. So there's that, and the token count also increases. So um, and another thing to note is that this is a fixed supply token. The circulating supply is fixed. Right, so there was a uh, liquidity drive event when we started, and that those tokens uh, were were distributed to all the um, holders that participated in raising liquidity. When they raised liquidity, there was an understanding that you know over fifty percent of their value was going to immediately be handed over, sacrificed to the graveyard, so that we have you know uh, uh, constant protection of uh, the liquidity by over 50% of the circulating supply, but it's a fixed, it's a fixed supply system. So um, the graveyard is an active participant. Every, go, every time it goes to 50%, from 50% to 51%, that 1% is converted directly back into liquidity. Um, the, the other dominant player is the treasury itself. Uh, all the front facing, um, to generalize deposit contracts, whether they be the NFTs or annuity contracts, they all uh, on deposit they create some percentage, uh, you know, between you know fifty all the way up to a hundred percent are converted into buybacks. And so, what you're seeing for this uh, decentralized community bank is that the liquidity pools themselves represent the the locked and transparent balance sheet of the bank. Literally, uh, we are, you know, uh, if we want to talk about risks, we are gambling on the fact that BNB will hold some percentage of its value long-term and may in fact um, rally with Bitcoin, right? And so, and that's not a bad bet to take considering uh, for the last bull market and for this entire bear market, BNB has, uh, persistent, persistently stayed in the top uh, five, five of all cryptos, and um, even though it's down, even though it's drawn down, it hasn't drawn down by as much as um, its peers in the top twenty to fifty. So, um, and you know, and the the last thing is so some people say, well, why B and B? Well, you know, at the time that this uh, we started building. Over two and a half years ago, there was only BNB, right? So there was there was ETH, there was Tron, and then there were BNB. And literally, this community that's been with me for six years, this community has been with me through six years of like learning and and trying to build the perfect mousetrap, if you will. 
on chain, 100% on chain. Um, we haven't ha- uh, uh, once we get the you know once once we were able to you know uh, transact with low fees. Um, you know, we, we don't care. There, there's, there's, there hasn't been any real innovation on EVMs in a, uh, in a while, right? So, so, so all these L1s can talk what they want to talk, but the reality is, is that you know, BNB has had what people really care about um, uh, in this sort of uh, hardcore DeFi space for a very long time, and that includes the good and the bad. So you got all the the the, the hackers, the scammers, uh, the builders, you know. You know the the people who are just you know looking to build utility, good or bad, you know at low cost. B and B has had that for a long time, and that's why if you actually take an unbiased view and look at the transaction volume on Binance Chain, there's a reason why it's the dominant force in the space. And I think um, you know we're working with Coin Market Cap and Coin Gecko right now to get the circulating supply properly listed and. Once that happens, um, you know, you talk about like, you know, when I watched your video, you talked about like, is it early or not? Um, we have a, a supply adjusted price, you know, which is basically the, our, our market cap divided by 21 million, you know, the circulating supply of, 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 uh, of, of Bitcoin because the elephant token is designed as a store of value. And basically the... Um, and I hate to be jumping around, but you know, there's there's a lot. Uh, but hopefully, I can just give this general overview, and then we can dive into some specific questions. But like, it's a store of value, and the way that it uh, functions as a store of value is by um, protocol owned, protocol 100 protocol owned liquidity, but also protocol owned supply, and so it's a fixed supply. But there's a stranglehold on that supply. And right now, what you're looking at is the graveyard with over 50 to 51%. It's a foregone conclusion that, you know, there's going to be an ever-rising floor in the base price of the elephant token. Uh, But then when you take into account the dynamics of um, uh, buyer of last resort on the front-facing yield products, you know, when they deposit, and and remember, there's daily utility. So there's there's over um, there's almost three thousand people participating um, on a at least a minimum weekly basis. Um, you know, interacting with the NFTs, interacting with the annuity products that are that are pushing funds in. People are, you know, making profit in their daily jobs, in their businesses, uh, in other parts of DeFi, in other parts of crypto, and um, you know through through a lot of hard work and being able to do the right things in not only good times, but in bad times, the people who are on board right now, they are using elephant money as their bank. And once you understand that, that's when it clicks. Okay, this isn't a speculative exercise for them. They're, these people are actually making deposits. And when you choose, and that's why um, you know, I encourage people to just you know, just looking at Dex tools and things like that, and just seeing all the buy streaming in, it does it. It, it kind of obfuscates what's really going on. If you go into the Telegram, where we show the same data, but with the buy bots, and um, you can actually see which transactions from the front facing products are generating the buys. And then when you see that stream of activity, then it can make complete sense. It's like, oh my God, like, you know, I just watched. You know, people going into futures, you know, uh, you know, back to back to back, you know, different sizes. Uh, I see people buying NFTs. I see people minting NFTs. I see people reselling NFTs. Once you see all of that activity. So so, so when you look at Dex tools and things like that, it all just looks like stream of buys, um, you know, small, large, medium. But like when you are in the Telegram chat and look at the, the, the bots that we uh, uh, work with the community to build. And by the way, I've done all the co- the code for the the protocol and the DAP, but I have done zero other coding. None of, none of the spreadsheets, none of the uh, Dune analytics, um, you know, Microsoft BI tools. You know, we have ton, literally tons of developers um, just making it easier for 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 the layperson or per- person just coming in to understand what the 
the system is actually doing. And so we have the most, we not only have, we not only have a, 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 a token that's performing, I mean, that, that's the least of my concerns. What I, I tell the community all the time, each one teach one. The, the reality is we have barely even scratched the surface of what is possible uh, because we only have like 30,000 holders. So I expect that, that that number to start to grow geometrically as we start to get better um, analytics coverage from these sites. So we've been able to fix the data with DeFi Llama. We've been able to fix the data with DAP Radar. Uh, we're beginning the we've begun the work with Coin Market Cap and with Coin Gecko. We've had a constant conversation, uh, and uh, frankly, you know, they could do a better job. Um, I think they have uh, they're very much skewed towards worrying about centralized exchanges. And obviously, we're a hundred percent on chain, hundred percent DeFi. Um, we will never, you know, list on a centralized exchange. You know, they can drag us kicking and screaming but we're not going to help them so uh and that is because the value capture that we we have just the the, the inherent uh, 10 percent on transfer um and then if you use the dap you can avoid some of those fees for different use cases like for example if you just want to transfer to your to a hardware wallet you can use the transfer built into the plat platform and and save seven percent only pay three percent so we have those types of things we're you know we're we're allowing people to uh, mm. lower the friction, uh, but understand that there's no there's no um, free lunch. Value capture on the back end, uh, on the back end, on the actual token itself is very important to how this all works. If we didn't have value capture, uh, people would be pumping and dumping this token left and right. Um, and so we have to make, ensure that every bot, every exchange. That that wants to own this token for a short period of time has to participate in the financial cooperative, and so um, you know, with every new innovation that's come to the marketplace, uh, like we were the first to implement uh, a RFI token, uh, but the diff and 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 we uh, implemented a safe one uh, in the form of. Uh, a product on bankroll on a bankroll network, which was which was my um, my second uh, protocol attempt um, that spanned both Ethereum and Tron. Um, it was a RFI token, ten percent in, ten percent uh, out fees. Uh, the only difference was it wasn't ERC it wasn't ERC twenty compliant, so um, that limited adoption. But that was one of the, our most successful uh, products, and people just loved it. And, you know, so people were basically, you were basically making zero, zero point, um, zero point zero three percent per day, you know, it was like 50, like 50, uh, like a little under 50% per year, um, just holding, uh, ETH or just holding Tron. Um, but yeah, uh. That's that that's that that that's the that's the high level rundown. Basically, uh, Elephant Money is a decentralized community bank. It has a a two sided marketplace. You have um, you know we're selling yield as the product on the front end. That's through annuities. That's through things that look like uh, real estate or just you know being able to own a a, a property. Uh, you put down your principal. You earn double digit returns on that. Uh, those are double digit returns are variable. Those are being paid out through real yields. That real yield is basically, you know, the way that works is the NFT stakers, um, they get 1% APR against an ever-growing treasury. So uh, basically you buy in once to own the property, right? And then you're receiving income on a, a constant basis. Uh, and so basically that's another opportunity to get in early. Every round, every 10,000 mints, uh, we we ha we go into a new round and the price just doubles. Um, we've proven, uh, and and the price in the marketplace, the marketplace is built right in. The the there's only one price. There's only two prices. There's there's the mint price, and then there's ten percent below the mint price, um, uh, uh, in the marketplace. So if you want to sell uh an NFT for profit, 
you have to buy it in a previous round and, and wait a couple rounds before you sell it. Or, you know, so some people have been reselling like right in the second round, but they're not making necessarily that much profit, right? Because also 30% of the resale value goes to the treasury. So we have all of these sort of feedback loops. You know, this is, um, if you look at a uh, uh, high performance combustion, you know, vehicle, you know, there's plumbing, there's, there's, there's exhaust management that, that can increase performance. There's everything that you can do in the engine. You have turbochargers, superchargers, you know, direct injection, you know, you know, the, the, the better you can get it turned it, it, into like an aerosol, you know, all these thermodynamics, you know, Michael Saylor talks about the thermodynamics of Bitcoin. Well, we, we've, we kind of one up Bitcoin in the sense that, you know, I can send you uh, flow diagrams, not again, not made by me, but made by community members, other software engineers, architects, mathematicians that just exist in the world who have been able to objectively look at the open source code, you know, have conversations with me and basically draw up these diagrams and, you know, spot on, this is how the system works. We just got a, another, somebody just, you know, submitted another uh, diagram that I really liked, which is just the latest, greatest, including everything that's been done, the current state of where the system is. Uh, I can share that link and, and drop it into your uh, chat, uh, but it's it's really amazing. I, um, I went to a, a Bitcoin uh, summit uh, in in Washington D.C. The, the the past week, and I spent like two hours with the founder of that. Uh, you know, I've been speaking there for like four years, but I spent like um, you know two hours like in just like a after hours you know meetup just sitting down and explaining the whole system and, and actually walking through that diagram. And when I showed him the diagram, this is a guy who's an engineer um, building all kinds of cool things in, in Africa, um, you know, uh, tr trying to do, you know, Bitcoin mining, the solar power, you, and, you know, just trying to use natural uh, resources to, to generate crypto. Um, you know, to, to, to help, uh, you know, provide for economic inclusion. And I'm, and I'm just showing him this thing. And, you know, he was blown away. He was like, you know, what we're doing is like just one little Island in this diagram that you have of your entire system. So, you know, we have the most transparent banking system on the planet. And that's one of the reasons why, these numbers are doing what they're doing with very small participation. I am, not, trust me that I am used to big numbers. I'm used to being responsible for big numbers, billions of dollars, uh, trillions of dollars, in fact. Um, and, you know, I've made a lot of people rich. And the money that's in elephant money right now is nothing. Like this is, this is barely one highly paid athlete. You know, you know, the people who really run the world, you know, the billionaires that run the world, this is a drop in the bucket. This is one, this is one coach. This is, this is nothing, you know, but it just, it just proves the, the, the concept. And now we move forward from there. But yeah, I'll take questions now. I mean, I hopefully I give it an overview. Um, and I sort of give some perspective to what we're doing. You're like, this is not rah, rah, rah. This is not like, we're all going to be rich and stuff like that. No. And I preach also, you know, to the community that like, Hey, you know, this is deep liquidity, but like, if you don't show discipline and, and let this thing grow in terms of the amount of customers that we should have for this to be a, a, a very profitable uh, financial cooperative, you actually have to show that even as our early participant, that you have the, uh, fiduciary discipline we're all not just participants but owners and if people are you know it's very hard to dump uh this token but you know you can call you can make it bleed and if you make it bleed you know people might think twice and you know that can definitely affect uh, adoption and escape velocity so so you know it's about changing the culture of DeFi as well along the way um, because it's not just the software at the end of the day. Um, 
it's not just the liquidity at the end of the day. It, it's the community that, that, that is really uh, important. And I think you see you see community members reaching out to you. You see, you know, your, you know, you just gaining awareness of this thing is all part of the process of uh, each one teach one, is which, which is what we live by. You know, we love um, to bring, you know, people on like SK and yourself um, who can, you know, dumb it down for people, you know, explain the risks so that people can go in eyes wide open. Um, but at the end of the day, I believe each individual participant, you know, can just, you know, grab their brother, grab their sister or coworker, whoever. Um, and just on that one-on-one -on -one basis also, um, th th that's the meat and potatoes of, of gr our growth and which will ultimately lead to um, geometric growth. I think we've barely scratched the surface because of these issues with the analytics sites. But once we get past that, then we're really cooking with gas. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. Um, OK, so as said, I will try to poke as many holes in this as possible, right? Because, um, yeah, I, I hope that you um, try to also convince the critics here because the people that are already convinced they will obviously get excited about what you've just said and will instantly buy things but um the others that are critical especially with this chart that is very unique for elephant money um they want to know the nitty-gritty details and so my first question here would be um you indirectly answered this we started this whole off with the question of this is not natural bias right there are time delayed buys and um, you mentioned basically the two side products, the staking product and the NFT product. And you also mentioned buy bots in this. Yes. Can you give um, a brief rundown, first of all, how these buy bots work as in uh, what is the frequency of buying? How much are they buying for like, say, each individual NFT purchase, etc.? And then mm -hmm. also, do you have a, um, a rough back of the envelope number as in how much is the price being pushed up by regular elephant money buys through the token and how much is being supported through the staking program and the nft program how is this buying pressure so to speak split up among those three and if there's a fourth or fifth kind of product that has significant impact on this as well uh, would be also interesting to know that but getting kind of a feeling of how much is um uh, is done by people that simply might just want to go in and out, just buy directly the token, get out again once they are break even after tax. And how much is buying pressure of the elephant token that is derived from those other regular long term investments? Mm -hmm. so, okay, uh, understood. So, so we have a great the circling supply is fixed, right? It's basically uh, uh, one uh, one quadrillion tokens, a thousand trillion tokens. Right. So that's never going to change. Right. So there's like there's like maybe like a little less than a trillion tokens that are in the liquidity drive event contract. And we subtract that from the total supply. So that's the last thing that we kind of worked on with coin market cap. Anyway, so getting back to that. So it's like a six to one ratio between natural uh, buyers that are like, you know, watching a chart, seeing it, you know, show up number one on Dex tools, things like that. Um, then. Uh, if you look at the recent kind of spike, like the, the, the sort of definitely change in trend of, of, of the chart, um, a lot of that where it's, it's kind of like, you know, approaching that 80% degree, um, degrees in terms of like the, the steepness of the chart that, that was, uh, the introduction of the NFTs a couple of months ago. So. And because the, the thing is, like, you know, over 10,000 BNB was directly injected into uh, the Treasury and, you know, kind of kicked off the next phase of the growth of the Treasury. Um, at the same time, if you look a little further back in history since January, that was the introduction of futures. And that also caused an inflection. You'll notice since the beginning of time, um, every time we've released front facing products, like basically adding more stuff to the McDonald's menu, 
we're attracting people with different taste buds. You know, some people want, you know, or they're okay with an annuity because, you know, they want a predictable, you know, fixed percentage per day. They don't care if they miss on the gains. You know, maybe they also own some elephant anyway, but they just want to have, you know, they're looking at, you know, can I use something that earns me passive income without me selling my elephant? So they get excited about that. We have the the NFTs again, you know, so for someone who has actually gone through the stresses of managing uh, commercial or residential real estate, they immediately get an appreciation for something that actually can pay double on the high end uh, in terms of APR or profitability per year um, w without the hassle of anything that goes along with real estate. Right. So, you know, so they're interested in the NFTs. They know that that's a long term hold. They know that in three years they'll break even. And that's way better than, um, you know, house flipping, uh, you know, owning commercial real estate, all that stuff. And they see. And, and then the last thing is they're getting paid out in a parabolic token, the elephant token. So. Um, so six to one ratio between natural buyers in the in the front office system. The one additional caveat I'll say is if you look at the lock liquidity and if you look at the size of the treasury, um, the treasuries had a little bit of a head start. So we have a lot of um, we have a lot of uh, lock supply of the token that's backing those yield front facing products that have basically been organically growing over time and, and, and with new releases and more capabilities over time. So the between the the graveyard and the uh, treasury, there's a dominance at play, right? With, with uh, I think the treasury 17%. The uh, holders have about a little over 20% now. So altogether, that's like, Basically, 67% 67, 67 of the tokens are under a controlled release, just paying out daily liabilities. Um, and then 20% uh, are just like free floating in the hands of the holders. And then there's a, and, and then of those, of those particular holders, there's a majority dominance of people that have basically been with the project for uh, two and a half years or more. So we have very strong holder base. Um, most of the, most of the new, so it's six to one. So at the end of the day, we're in a phase where while the token is still cheap, we use the, uh, Bitcoin supply adjusted price to kind of get some grounding there. Like, you know, really what is, what is, uh, you know, we're at 57 cents per million now. What does that really mean? So we go back to using the supply adjuster price to better rationalize it with the entire crypto community. So, you know, we're at basically $27 Bitcoin. So we're still very early. Holders are still sub 100K. So so early, early, early there. Um, yeah, so most of this is, at this point, is 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 natural buying, but we have a strong base. We have a strong base uh, uh, that's been built up in the treasury uh, on people using the front-facing uh, products. And of those front-facing products, um, the NFTs are kind of like, you know, fire and forget, right? But people also do top up because the 1% APR from the treasury um, is fixed, right? So it's, a, it's fixed liabilities for the system. And also the additional benefit is that it scales up and down. So if we were ever to have the treasury retrace in value, so it could, so even if token count is always increasing, I suspect the token count will always be increasing because it always gets a cut of all activity, just simple transfers, buys and sells, and also the front facing products. The likelihood probability is 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 over ninety percent that we're going to have token growth, but at the same time, you know, B and B could literally be chopped in half overnight. You know, some black swan event. So we always have to take that into account. Um, the cool thing about the NFTs is it doesn't matter 
what the price of B and B is. Let's 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 forget about B U S. Our B U S D L P, by the way, is is a is a nice backstop. But let's forget about that for a second. Let's just consider B and B. If B and B was to tank, go and you know Black Swan event go in half, the NFTs don't care, right? The, as a matter of fact, the NFTs are cheaper to buy, and you might you know blow through a couple of rounds uh, because it's 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 now um, very profitable to you know grow a lion share of that one percent APR, right? And then that naturally you know, price so- uh, causes a supply shock in terms of the price. Because remember this, every token, every V2 token, whether it's in Uniswap or uh, PancakeSwap, it's, they're all governed by the same constant product formula, very simple pricing function. So every token can perform this way if it has adequate buy pressure, if it has adequate demand. Right. And if and if you can control the supply. So basically, you know, um, you know, not to toot my own horn, but have been doing this for a long time. Um, So, like, I'm the grayest, grayest, gray haired version of Tony Stark. You know, we both graduated from MIT. So um, so this is engineering at its finest. I will never uh, take that away from. Uh, the community or myself, <laughs> like you know, w- this is engineered. This is not spitballing. This is a lot of trial and error. Um, to put it in perspective, um, SpaceX is the number one way that satellites g- get up into space in the world, and it was six years of trial and error before they had a successful landing. To put that all in perspective, so you know, engineering is pain, <laughs> and, and 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 lots of trial and error, but you know realize that you know if you're trying to explain how like a tesla actually works you're going to have a long very long conversation same thing here you know we're explaining how um the best version of a bank works and that's not to say that we can't have better versions i'm just saying that this is the first i liken it to an alligator you know, alligators have been around a long time, you know, since prehistoric times, and they pretty much dominated fresh waterways. Um, All right. Um, sorry this... to interrupt. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah I, I just want to make this um, uh, as efficient as possible. And uh, maybe yeah, ahead, we, we, maybe get, get a bit too far off once we talk about SpaceX and alligators. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, first of all, I find it very, very impressive actually that um, with only one sixth of the buyers locking their money up with those buying bots, right, with NFTs and staking, etc., that only requires basically 17% of the investors to do these investments to reduce the volatility basically to zero of the price chart, right? Because this apparently seems to be what's happening because the purchases of the elephant token are delayed over time through those two products, the price chart can look the way it does. Is this the correct understanding? Yes. And, and if you look at if you if you if you dial in, if you look at the at the volume over a given day, you, you'll see that there is selling. There's plenty of selling. Yeah, yeah. But, but I, mean, I mean I mean net, right? If you look just at daily candles, um, it is a price chart that is very, very unique, right? And and this is obviously right. the first question everybody has. And they don't necessarily need to understand every detail, but they want to understand why is the price chart the way it is. And the reason it is this way is because one out of six dollars in the ecosystem get put into long-term assets like the staking program and the NFT program. And the purchases of the elephant token through those two uh, products are with a time lag. They are delayed over time with these bots. And because these purchases are stretched out over time, that's why the price is the way it, the, the price chart is the way it looks like, right? Is this like yes? Okay, Can right. You... And yeah. the 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 NFTs they actually buy in real time because we wanted to inc- so we we had a problem where we weren't generating enough transactions to get noticed by like Dex tools and things like that. So when the NFTs go, they fire instantly against the LPs and you can create and create a buy or sell transaction things like that. Um, the, 
the futures product does batches though. So every 10 minutes, it'll see if there's like $3,000 worth of uh, financial activity uh, ready to go. And then it'll, and then it'll do a $3,000 buy. Th those don't really um, move the needle in terms of transaction volume, but they, they do create like a little heartbeat, if you will. But if you look at the 15 minute, which is like the default chart, like when you go on the homepage of the site, it's clear to see that there's, it's, it looks like a Christmas tree. It's like red and green. So there's tons of selling and tons of buying going all going along, but it's always a steady tick up because intraday tons of sales, but the net is always positive. And the net yeah, and is could, always, yeah, the net is always positive specifically for elephant. And not for, yeah. Uh, and specifically for, yeah, I yeah, understand. Um, is uh, positive, especially for elephant, because uh, mainly of the staking product, it must be right when the um, when the direct purchases are like with everybody else's token, and if the NFT purchases are also instant, then the only thing that is time delayed is the staking, which is those three thousand dollar batches. That must be then the only reason why the chart looks the way it does. It's the staking purchases, right? I mean, besides right. just we adoption, et cetera, but adoption, a lot of, a lot of protocols have adoption. So the question, maybe, maybe the reason why I asked this is because, um, I want to know how high is the likelihood that on a daily chart, that this chart pattern breaks, that on a daily chart after the NFTs have all been purchased, right? After, after the initial hype, the initial adoption of NFT purchases, dies down, right? There's always an initial adoption, then it, it slows down after a while. Um, when this slows down, how high is the risk that actually the chart pattern breaks? Because I could imagine once the chart pattern breaks that at least parts of those six people in the six to one ratio are going to freak out. Maybe not the one out of the six that has deployed for long term and that believes and it understands all of this, but a lot of or at least some of the people in the six to one ratio that are on the six side that just bought the token, they might just bite the bullet. Let's say the price goes down by um, 20% in the next two days for whatever reason, right? Somebody decides to sell. Um, I could imagine that this could, in theory, create a loop effect that more people based on that would sell as well. As said, right? I'm asking here the hard questions. I'm, I'm, asking, I'm talking yeah. about risk. And so if there would be a lot of regular buying from other products, or if the ratio would even be better and it would be half of the people doing, let's say half of, let's say it this way, right? Let's say half of all the capital going into elephant money would be staking and all of that money is super delayed in purchases. Then people that get into this have the guarantee, so to speak, that the graph will look the way it does for a prolonged period of time, right? The less people, the less delayed purchasing pressure there is, the more this chart is at risk to not look the way it does like this in a few months from now. That's my thinking. And I'd like to kind of um, get your, your thoughts on this. First of all, yeah, like as, as yeah, much as possible with hard string. numbers as well. Yeah, we could pull on that string. I mean, the NFTs, the NFTs have their cycles, and I think we've already seen like one cycle play out. Like after the round, after the round finish, there was a delay. There was a delay in the in the buying of the second round, and the second round didn't pick up until the APR started rising again. So what happens is, with the NFTs from round to round, after a round completes, right? You you've had all this injection of capital. Um, the APR comes down as that round completes. The APR comes down because there's there's more there, there's the people have invested, they have immediately invested, and now uh, the token price has to act, has to actually increase for the a overall APR of the entire ecosystem to increase for the NFTs. So we see that kind of like delayed action going on in the NFTs. That's the NFTs. The uh, futures is very much you know and this is why we use the the, the hamburger analogy um hamburgers are delicious yield is delicious right for investor 
you know, uh, you know, high yield, you know, anything over like, you know, the 5%, you know, that the, 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 the sort of the treasury rate is right now, whatever it is, five, seven percent, any, anything that beats that love it. Right. The, the way we crack the code, remember, I've been working on this annuity style contract for a very long time. Um, the way we crack the code is you don't get a free compound. There's no auto compounding. Uh, you, there's no compound button that you can just click every day or every hour. Uh, you know, you're familiar with farming products, you know, like you're getting yields, you can pull that yield out, you can roll it back in, right? You know, if you're, if you're in a, if you're in a, in the farms, you know, staking an LP, you can um, take that single-sided yield, sell half of it, create more LP, stake that, and then, you know, you're increasing your balance, you're increasing, you're increasing your, your daily yield that you're earning. In our system, you can, in the future system, you can only uh, compound with fresh capital, and there's a minimum amount. So $200 is what you can use to start an initial account, and every time you have some available interest that's built up, you can either withdraw that, which will subtract from your balance, or you can uh, add $200. That $200 will be added as well as the available interest that has been built up that'll get all folded into your balance right and you'll still continue to earn 0.5 percent a day on that balance so because of that we have a, a business profile you have to remember that like those injections into the treasury are very similar to free cash flow that's being you know captured through profitability of that front-facing business, and it's getting stored into our coffers, which is that elephant treasury. We have 100% value capture, right? And we just have to pay out those daily uh, liabilities. Uh, that's the only overhead, is just, just, to, just to shave off the top of the treasury and pay out that daily liabilities. Because you cannot compound without like, just like you can't go to McDonald's and just get a free hamburger. You have to fork up another $5 to get another hamburger to eat. So the hamburgers are the yield. So you have to, you have to every, so just like any service, you have to pay for service. And so to paying for service in this model is very simple. You just have to make an, a, an additional investment uh, to continue to fold in your, your yield. And, and, and to increase your balance. And that balance only increases to like a million max with a max payout of, of, of two and a half million total. Um, when you compound, that counts. When you compound, that counts as you getting paid, by the way. So you just can't start like at $200 and just put the very minimum in. Like, you know, it's going to take you quite a while to compound to a million dollars if you take that strategy of just, you know, depositing every, like say $200 every month. But the bottom line is that you, while many investments are fire and forget in the world, m most securities, I would say, most securities are kind of fire and forget. You buy the security and then you're, you're, you're depending on the actions of others to make money. This is different. This is decentralized. And ultimately, how much you make in futures specifically is determined by how you play the game. And, and, and you're, yeah. yeah. So I, I think that uh, hopefully that makes sense. Basically, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on oh. a second. Um, hold on a second. That's my kids. <laughs> uh, hopefully, um, it was not the price chart. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that. Um, if I could throw something out. Well, there, one, one question. Uh, you probably know ahead. this, SK. Uh, just a prog question. Uh, I heard there's like this limit of uh, depositing maximum 1 million to the staking program and maximum of 2.5 million paying out. Is this ratio also, is this a fixed ratio or is this just a, a cash out limit? So let's say you put in $1,000, is the maximum you can ever cash out a 2.5k? No, sir. No, sir. It's It all stacks on top of each other. Uh, okay. On my screen share here, there's the question here. It, it's the ultimate payout. It's the cash out ultimately. So like, Remember when I went over my example, I said I want to just build to a hundred thousand and then mm -hmm. start my claim 
compound cycle. Well, I'm going to do that until this one, one day hits 1 million balance. And I can claim out all the way until this claim number reads 2.5 million. And mm -hmm. so once I one day, you know, years from now, when I one day hit a max balance, then I will just start a new wallet. I will take oh, okay. maybe so, so you per know, user that's okay. Got it. Yes. yes. Per user, there's a max payout of two and a half million, and you can start with maximum one million. Yes. Yes. Okay. And if I could tie um, another thing up in a bow that he was saying, like uh, on my screen share, you can see part of the Telegram. But um, he was saying, if you look at the Telegram bots, they're they're displaying what activity is always happening inside mm. of the ecosystem. So like this person, for example, they just put in 200 BUSD into that futures staking that we just mentioned. But mm. then this person came in, they bought one BNB worth. Then you come down here to the NFTs. Look, it yeah. shows the last 10 NFTs that were minted. Mm -hmm. And then these are the elephant purchases that happened with those NFTs. Look, they're two BNB per NFT. That's a two BNB purchase, two BNB purchase, two BNB purchase. So all the activities tracked here. And I think that's what, you know, when you made your video, it's more than just the token. It's the, it's the menu items on my screen here, the right side. Not only do you have the token, like the Big Mac at McDonald's, but then you've got the chicken nuggets at Futures. People are putting into that. You've got the desserts at the unlimited NFTs. You've got trunk token that people are minting. You've got farms here. So you have so many different items that whenever people mm. put money into it, it actually converts it into elephant token to stuff into the treasury. So yeah. one last thing, I think this will make sense for you too. Um, on uh, right here. So, you know, that delayed buyback of the elephant token you were mentioning. So when we discussed earlier, this BUSD treasury, right? So this is a timed delay purchase of elephant token and that's actually captured by this governance contract so when i explain that after the flash loan there was a ring of protections put in place so it can never happen again this is one of those protections this busd treasury so daily there's a there's money building up and it's right here you see this elephant buyback strategy there's two thousand dollars so that money right here this two thousand dollars is coming out of the current BUSD treasury and when a community member uh, hits this buyback button they call this contract um, it will then take two thousand dollars it will purchase it on the chart and stuff it into Bertha and it'll show up in, on a on a buy bot in the telegram you'll see when Bertha does these uh, buybacks so I hope that kind of wraps some of the okay. stuff up together for you that's interesting so okay so currently there's kind of 2.26k that are delayed yes. in purchase and ap apparently yes. maybe this gets even auto triggered once it hits 3000 because there was a 3000 yeah. number floating around yeah there's an auto trigger i believe okay and um so if i wanted to get in let's say i want to have the most efficient way to get into the system i would get a friend to give me an affiliate link to get this elephant token cheaper then once i did this then I would afterwards hit this buyback button. I would wait with my purchase until we are very close to 3K in this governance thing. And then right after my purchase, I would click the buyback button to inflate the price a little bit more as well. Because that's probably what's going to happen, right? There will be another purchase of 2.3K that I can trigger after me. Yeah. And I click this buyback button. Right? This would be kind of the most efficient way, I believe. You could, and if you don't hit the button, someone else is at least mm. every 30 minutes. Yeah, but this button's it, always yeah. Hit. yeah, Binance Smart Chain yeah. is super cheap anyways. But yeah, okay. So I would basically wait until we are very close to those 3K, and uh, then I would do my purchase via an affiliate link. And then there should be, right after that, come another 3K purchase because of this. And what I now yeah. understand... So, so, what, so still, right? So... I'm, I'm, that's maybe also the reason why I sometimes have to interrupt um, a bank teller. Uh, is uh, I, I want to get really to the to the details, right? I don't want to talk too much, um, uh, yeah, too much uh, things that are not 100% related to the tokenomics, to the flows of money. Even though this might be the interest of of a lot of you guys, right? Because you need to get everybody excited, and it's uh, all a, a community thing; it has to grow. But I'm interested in uh, the risk and yeah. uh, 
and what mitigates some of them? Yeah. what mitigates risk is are delayed are delayed purchases and are of course also new products that get introduced that generate new purchases of course um yes but uh delayed purchases for me are the best if you have a treasury that holds stuff or if you have like something like this that buys things now this seems to be so far so i'm trying to understand is is this the only mechanism those three thousand dollars every now and then is this the only mechanism that that makes every candle turn green recently Besides, of course, there's now this, you know, the new NFT that got launched, etc. that creates a new buy pressure. But let's say the NFTs, uh, for whatever reason, don't get purchased that quickly anymore to support as much growth. Would be this delayed 3K every now and then. I wonder even also how often this happens, but we can figure this out. Um, yep. Is so that the only thing? To... Yeah. Okay, so, so you have, you, you... <clears throat> And this is why you zoom out and you have to understand business. So I have a, you know, you know, 25, 25 years in actual institutional finance, stay street paid for my business degree. Okay. And I've been, a, I've been at the executive level at both of those companies for a very long time. So you have to understand product market fit. You have to understand that there are two main products in finance that people are looking for. There's two categories. There's only two categories. You either, there's either yield or price appreciation. There's yield or growth. It's one or the other. It's dividend stock or growth stock. You know, and having something lukewarm in between is very poor market, product market fit. So like most of, most of the stock market is, is a dud, right? <clears throat> there's a reason why the S&P 500 is dominated by... Um, dividend bearing like the mcdonald's of the world and growth the apples of the world okay so elephant growth the front-facing products yield right it's it's very similar to food you need food to eat you, you need food to live you gotta eat to live same thing in finance you you need yield or growth to live there's no in between so <clears throat> Because we have such strong product market fit, what does that mean? It means that strong, and, and it can be measured objectively. Objectively, we have strong product market fit on the elephant side, best performing asset in the world two years running. That's strong product market fit on the growth side. Strong product market fit on the yield side <clears throat> is can you beat treasuries? Treasuries, five to 7% right now, um, our lowest performing products, which would be the NFTs, are doing uh, 36%. That's double yeah. the best you can get out of commercial. Okay. Right? Um, so, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt because so, I want so, to, so, to get... So, yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up for the benefit of everyone. So when people say, what if you run out of customers? That's kind of a ridiculous statement. We're, we're only here because we have strong product market fit. So simplifying it and dumbing it down for people. The reason why McDonald's is still in business because as trashy as their product actually is, people still like to taste the hamburgers. Pizza Hut still sells pizza because people like to taste the pizza. Like, you know, and because of those things, they, they'll keep on selling them. Now, you know, the, the new, new entrants can come into the market. There can be competition. The idea is that you grow you grow and you, you, you get a certain level of dominance that you, can, that, you, that you can take this new product or take a new way of delivering this product. Like his hamburgers were made before McDonald's existed as well. I encourage everybody to watch The Founder. It's about, this, it's about how they took McDonald's from one store, you know, that was started by these, the, the two McDonald's brothers, whatever. But it was, that, it was the guy played by Michael Keaton who actually, you know, made McDonald's what it is today which is like a real estate business. So <clears throat> anyway, like that, that demand is not go going away and that's a constant demand. And for the, and to simplify it in terms of what we really spent a lot of time on, that futures product requires you, it requires reinvestment. Every time you walk into the restaurant, 
you have to sign. You have to. You have to. You have to pay the check at the end of in the end at the end of the meal. You have to pay the check to convert that yield, and, and to compound that yield, you have to put in a minimum of two hundred dollars. So it's a relationship. It's a business. It's not just a you know fire and forget. Now there's an operating relationship, and, and people are going to have different results based on you know how much fresh capital they bring to the table. So that's what's always going to constantly drive the futures product. Now, it's not just dependent on the futures product. I'm actually more excited about the NFT product because that oh, real estate real estate is how most people achieve wealth in the world. And we basically have a better mousetrap than real estate right now. Like BlackRock, the reason why BlackRock, the reason why BlackRock is um, – the reason why BlackRock is 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 um, pushing Bitcoin is because they can't continue to buy up all these neighborhoods around the world, these residential properties around the world, and price people out of that market. The consumer is buckling, so that's that's not working anymore. And so that's why they need they absolutely need the Bitcoin ETF to work. They have to make sure they can have a stranglehold on it, but it has to work as the sort of Infinite way, it, it, it's it, it's it's the new asset that can grow uh, infinitely in a world where you have uh, inflation. These things matter. You cannot talk about like the game, like DeFi as it has been, with like you know, frankly, people who don't know a lot about finance just goofing around on chain. We're we're, we're past that. We're past that, and so and so you're you're going you're going to see more professional systems enter the marketplace, starting with simply the Bitcoin ETF, which is going to solve a massive problem in terms of uh, uh, the fact that you know these muni these these uh, these uh, municipalities and 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 basically teachers unions, whatever you want, you know, <laughs> these things are collapsing. Um, and yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's and, so, sorry. <laughs> I, I really yeah, think I, I, I understand your passion and I understand the fundamental idea behind this, but I really try to understand the tokenomics and I, I don't need uh, yeah. teacher unions, Elon Musk and alligators. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to sound too, too harsh, but I, I just, no, I, I no, want to keep do. it uh, focused. I love, I love Are you German, by the way? Are you German? Yes, I am, and that's why I'm so open. <laughs> I love, I love Germans. I love working with Germans. I, my best product manager was a German. Yeah. So I, I love the, I love the counterbalance. But I, but, but, but this shit matters. Like, the, yeah. you, you can't do, you can't do this without knowing that. You, you, you can't know. Like, you have to build for product to achieve product market fit. You have to understand what people want. And the, the biggest problem with DeFi is no product market fit. So that so the knowing the history and knowing and knowing why products succeed and just knowing what products are actually sold in real world finance matters. Like knowing which products are most successful in finance matters. Annuities actually aren't that annuities have always been scammy. Annuities are scam like like they sell annuities on television to to old people, but that's what they want <laughs> because they usually have a big stack of money, but they don't have income, and they can't survive without income. If they just sell their stack of money, they're dead in the water and they become homeless. Okay, so these things matter. You have to know, you have to understand you have to understand why are there so many old people in elephant money. How many, like, there's tons of people saying, I'm a retiree. Why do you see such large balances? Just people just chucking these huge, huge it's, be, it's because a strong product market fit for annuity-based product that doesn't rely on trust where they're going to get yeah. bug pulled. I think, I think um, that can't be disputed that you guys have product market fit, right? You are one of the largest players on the Binance Smart Chain uh, right now. And um, I'm not disputing this whatsoever. Um, what I am wondering is, for somebody that has been burned 
in DeFi several times, right? There has been more than one occasion where uh, DeFi has overpromised, and um, some people, especially those guys that got burned, might see similarities, even though you might be different. Um, the people that see similarities might not um, see the difference in some of the arguments, and that's why I poke here. For example, Hex, right? I don't want to put you in the same category as Hex, but Hex was also one of the largest and fastest growing and most price appreciating DeFi projects until it wasn't. And so my questions are focusing towards, even though Hex had a product market fit, even though it had growth, what makes your system more stable? And I think stability comes a lot from capital that is being locked up and used for stabilizing the ecosystem during bad times. And you seem to be doing partially a good job already on the daily time frame, right? On the daily time frame, um, the price is going up every day. So this is, a, this is very good financial engineering, obviously. Um, but the question is, is there a day until it isn't? And of course you say, no, there, it will continue for this forever. People are locking their money up. But then I want to see as many convincing numbers around this as possible. For example, I personally like the staking product a lot. More than the NFTs, even though the NFTs are newer. Because the NFTs, they purchase all at once. And you are to a degree dependent on round three, four, five, six of NFTs still selling well and keeping product market fit. If they don't, uh, then that part of the cash flow will stop. However, with the staking program, where you get the buy-in from people to regularly deposit, you've got commitment of cash inflows that support the elephant price. And there is an implicit... Um, return expectation, not just in terms of like tokens and the 0.5% in staking, there is a implicit return implication from the people, from the six out of one people, or the six out of seven people that just bought the token, there is this expectations by most of those guys that the current pattern of the chart will not break. And if the next NFT round of sales, uh, if the next sales of NFTs won't be as large, um, as at some point in Hex, also the purchases of the Hex didn't grow as quickly as hoped, then momentum might turn around and this could create a cascading effect. And so I'm looking for points for as many mechanisms as possible besides just um, good marketing and uh, current product market fit. I'm looking for as many pointers as possible that point towards survivability in times of potential crisis despite the high expectations implied by the current very steep stable price chart so uh so i would like to see as much as possible data so my ideal scenario would be for example here look at this wallet it's got three million worth of dollars in it and it's purchasing elephant tokens every day and the reason why the price is so stable because it's that wallet purchases every day or here is the staking program it has grown by that much uh, over time and from the staking program where people have committed towards um, purchasing and they purchase every month or whatever it is um, we can expect that the staking program will continue to generate inflows into elephant money purchases by that amount and because of that we expect the price chart not to break. You know where I'm coming from? It's a, it's a very technical yeah. way of looking at things. I'll it's give not, you data. I'll, but, give you, um, I'll give you the data. I'll but it is. The, data. I know that. Okay, the reason, the reason why I do this is because I, I am obviously a critic and I've made a, a, no, a video that I was very it. critical. And I think you're, you're, um, you, you can approach this call in two ways, right? You could either simply do the regular um, way you always sell this. Uh, which, which you can, and it obviously works to a degree. But you could also try to convince critics like me um, by following that line of argument. 
I, I do it. I do it always. Let's. Uh, that's why they brought me in. So, um, uh, and and obviously, like I am not a promoter. I actually built this damn thing, so I, I know it in and out. I know. I know the math. I know the engineering. I know all the dirty details of every blockchain. So, in 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 to summarize, in the most objective way, mathematically possible, in the simplest way, Occam's razor, right? If you can't accept the simplest solution, which is the, usually the right one, I don't know what to tell you because this is engineering. So this is why this works. Remember that the constant product formula is what's determining the price. So what do we know about the constant product, pro, uh, product formula? It's a parabolic function. So a parabolic function, the way a parabolic function works is the more you go forward in X, the more you go forward in X, the steeper the rise in Y. So the thing that's determining the price is volume. So with consistent volume, not even an increase, and remember that volume is determined by the amount of net buys that the community is laying down. Okay? So these and let's let's just stick with the staking product. Let's just stick let's just stick with futures, right? So the average the average account size for futures is around $7500. $7,500 is not going to break the bank. That means out of like uh, uh, out of the uh, close to 3,000 participants in futures, you know, $7,500 is what they have in there. So it's not like these people have $100,000 accounts and things like that. So there's going to be very little. If you look at the daily liabilities, you see that those daily liabilities are well under $100,000. Uh, and then in addition, you see the there's a buffer pool and the buffer pool is always going to be some fraction above the daily liabilities because it always uh when when the uh, uh when anyone makes a claim if it's over 1% of the of the buffer pool uh elephant will be sold uh in uh, 10% it'll be uh, it'll be sold at 10% uh, above the actual claimed amount and, and topped off in the buffer pool. So the buffer pool makes it so that as we're selling intraday, or as, we're, as people are making claims intraday, they're not necessarily hitting the chart. And when they're not hitting the chart, that means that we can layer buys back to back to push the price up. And that's another reason why we always net out positive during the day is because we protect the LPs against price action from futures by basically um, you know, topping it up every time a whale does a big claim. So we'll take that hit once, but we're not taking that hit all the time. We're not st streaming a bunch of cells from the futures product. Um, here's the other thing. So with constant, with constant volume, with constant volume, as we move along in time forward, Right, we're 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 staircasing up. Less, uh, you get more price impact because we're 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 gonna we're gonna take we're gonna we're, of course there's growth, right? But we're gonna discount that for a second. We're not we're not growing the community. It's constant. You know, people are putting in their two hundred dollars a day or whatever. That's it. Based on a parabolic function, as you move forward in y, in X, the price impact, the amount of movement in Y goes up. And so that is that is what that is what is happening. So all things being equal, as long as we have constant participation, we're going to get this increase in Y. And that is exactly what you're seeing. That is exactly what you're seeing because we have control of the overall supply. If we just take into and we already know that this is a this is a small part. So the real risk is remember that there's that six to one ratio between natural buyers and the participants in futures. So those people who are buying can always dump. But the good news is that we have long term participants that already had a majority of the tokens. And so people coming in now. They're just taking this whole thing to the next level, but in terms of the actual ownership that's by the core community that's not going to dump so in some ways you can kind of we can even discount the holder base as being a risk because it's already been in proven solid hands 
when we had the exploit, our top holders doubled down. They didn't sell. So, um, and they understand the yield bearing products. So they're going to take profit into the yield bearing products and, and it, basically giving their tokens over to the treasury for safekeeping. And in, 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 in turn, the treasury is going to pay out yield in perpetuity. And so you, you, it all comes down to controlling where the circulating supply lives, right? And knowing that if we control where the circulating supply lives, then the thing that's going to determine the overall price is that constant product formula, which is pure math, has already been determined. We have, I think we have EMH on this call. We have, we have SK on this call. Uh, we know where for every, uh, uh, for every amount of trillions of elephant tokens in the LPs, we have, we know what the price is. If SK can bring up that chart, we'll, we'll tell you, we'll show you where the, where the price has been and where it's going. We already know. That's why I always tell the, that's why I always tell the community, each one teach one, we already know where the price is gonna be. You know, we, we know exactly where the price is gonna be when there's only, I think there's a, what is there, under 80 trillion tokens now, or close to 80 trillion tokens now in the LPs. We know where it's going to be when it hits 60 trillion. We know what the price is going to be. So now we just we just say, okay, well, well, what we only have we have 10 percent, 10 percent of the participants in the elephant token. That's the representation that we have in the futures product. Well, what happens if the futures product just doubles or triples? So you see that this this smaller the smaller community within the ecosystem, you know, is providing that that baseline heartbeat. And the way the relationship works is they're going to reliably, like those those deposits just keep on growing. But you, if if you look at the NFTs, it's the same thing. It's you know you have product market fit, you have adoption. So really, what's driving this is that we're at the base. We're at the base floor for adoption, which is going to drive that constant product formula. So what's going to ultimately happen is more adopt adoption is the function. Everything else is a derivative of that function. On the on the on the staker side, we have um, we have a, a a customer value of seventy five hundred dollars. Then, you know, uh, similarly, on the elephant holder side, we have an average amount of tokens that uh, elephant holder uh, holds. I, that number is somewhere. Oh, this actually, actually, this chart is what, we're what I was talking about. So you see that? Like, so we know exactly where the price is going to be. It's going to be at like, so we'll hit uh, 60 cents as soon as we drop a little bit below 80 trillion. And you, you see that we're... We're about 57 cents now, and it's pretty much on 80 trillion. So this is um, this is literally just gauges on a car. So similar to a car, when you put gas in, you know how far you're going to go. Similar here, you you tell me the volume, you tell me how much is in the in the liquidity pools. I can tell you the price, and I can tell you how fast we're going to get to the next price. It's just basic math. Oh, and like to sum it all up, we're we're at the ground floor. We're literally like you know, uh, open AI, fastest product adoption in history. You know, millions m millions of customers in less than five days. You know, Instagram. You know, kids on Instagram, fifteen years old with a million followers. That's the world we live on. Live in. The marketing is actually bad. We're actually doing a terrible job at marketing. This isn't about marketing. It's about a tight knit community that's starting to grow, starting to get its flowers, starting to get its recognition, and knowing and 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 already doing a pretty good job in terms of product market fit and actual the engineering of the product. You know, we have a we have a working product that has yet to be marketed. That's the whole, whole point. 
that's the point is that we have like no adoption. 30,000 people is zero adoption. I think, <laughs> okay. So when we just don't look at the, um, the number of participants, where we look at well, the quality of participants, the target should probably be to move as many people as possible from plain elephant token holders to actually doing either staking slash futures or NFT purchases, right? This would yes. uh, improve the health. The way I yeah, understand if, it. If I add, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm one of the top holders too, but I'll, I'll give you a real example. Somebody I know a month ago put in $50,000 and they had the choice. They said, you know, I'm thinking about putting it into futures, but I might just put it into the token instead, all my $50,000. And here's why. He chose the elephant token because... He sees the trajectory we're on. He believes in the tokenomics and the protocol, right? Remember, the protocol is locking up all these tokens and squeezing the price up. So he made his choice. And at the 10x, his 50,000 will turn to 500,000. At that point, this is the mentality that happens. And even with all the current top holders, he will profit take 20% of his, his 10x bag. So that means... $100,000 will come out of his 500000 He will then put that 100000 into futures, right? Minus the fees collected, right? But 100000 into futures. And then with that three to one model I explained to you earlier before BT got here, he will live off of that 3500 the first month, 37 the next, 4000 the next. He will now live off of his future yield and never have to touch his elephant again. That, that, I think once that starts to click with people, like, wow, the top holders, they're not really, there's no incentive to dump the entire bag. You just profit take from that bag, leave 80% of it to Moon, while you diversify into the NFTs, into futures, into trunk, into trumpet, stampede, farms. There's so many things on the menu. That's what the smart participants of this protocol are going to do. They're going to just profit take and put it into futures in the rest of the ecosystem. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Um, all right. Okay, so again, right? So I simply wanna wanna uh, poke at, in the uh, wanna poke at the stability of the current price trend. I'm very focused on the price trend because everybody is. And so, could you see a scenario where one day the price goes down by? 20% for whatever external reason, right? Maybe there's some, some external effect happening. The price goes down by 20, 25%. People want to get out. They sell despite the tax. Um, and this creates something bigger. What could catch that? What could, uh, what could turn this whole thing around? Besides the conviction of the people that are now deepest inside, is there kind, some kind of tokenomics mechanism that could uh, stop a sharp drop from getting worse. Yeah, um, that and that's just basic bread and butter tokenomics. Like, um, what 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 do whales do? Or, um, what do whales do when Bitcoin drops? They buy every. If you look at the Bitcoin, if you look at the the volume distribution. Yeah, um, but especially but hex, hex people didn't buy, right? So I'm not playing devil's advocate. Yeah, because it's a shitcoin. Like you, 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 okay. So I always tell the team, I always tell the community, chess not checkers. We have we have to make logical assumptions. We have to go in with a strategy. So you know, you you ask what would happen if the price, you ha you ask what would happen if the price falls. We have to take into account that this is a, a product with product market fit that has beaten Bitcoin for the past two years. So again, so did hex. It so is, did hex. It is, I'm I'm oh, devil's no, advocate no, no, here. Not for the past, not for multiple years, just for a window of time. Oh, for, for I, like I, more I, than I two years. Hex, hex grew by more than two years like this. So I'm, I'm trying to find arguments that I could not make for hex. So, okay, getting back to it. You want the answer? This is the answer. Like, so basically, there are always going to be motivated buyers with cash flow. So we have, we, we you have to understand the who's participating. We have lots of small businesses that are participating. Remember, we only have 30,000 
holders, but we have a disproportionate amount of locked liquidity. Why? And it's not hedge funds and things like that. There are some hedge funds, but there, but there are also lots of businesses. There's a business in Florida that sells spirits, right? You know, we have we have some pretty impressive, um, you know, business people, small business owners, medium business owners in their own right that have put Elephant effectively on their balance sheet. Those and plus those drops happen. Like those, if you actually zoom out, and look at the chart, you see that there have been plenty of. There have been some significant red days, and 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 usually those red days come from B and B dropping. Remember that our our biggest risk is exposure to B and B, and B and B has rugged us during this whole parabolic rise, right? So B and B used to be at our height was worth, um, well over four hundred dollars. Per B and B, B and B is now worth half that. It's down thirty something percent for the year. We're up three hundred fifty plus for the year, right? That that happens because um, we can fight the downdraft of the price of B and B because of the constant product formula. Because we force new participants. When I say new participants, in this case. It means new buyers day of, right? New buyers day of are going to have to pay a price that's enforced by a mathematical function. We only have one venue. We only have one venue where we're trading, right? We're not, we're not trade. This is not a speculative asset. It is literally just like, you know, the, the, the computer in your car tells the fuel injectors how much gas to release. That's what's going on here. So, like, we have predictable behavior. I just showed you the price chart. We have predictable behavior. So when the price drops, those motivated buyers will step in to get Elephant at what? A price they were unable to ever get because the price keeps on going up because the function, it's, it's literally mathematically coded to go up. Yes. It's, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, just, we're talking about five lines of code. We're talking about five lines of code in Uniswap V2, which determines the price. Like, that's where the price comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. It's just based on the, the ratio of the tokens in the liquidity pools. It's not speculative. It's not emotional. It doesn't care about, you know, how uncertain or certain you are about the project. Five lines of code determine the price of this product, of, of the elephant token, period. So. People who are playing the game right or, or actually have their cash flow situation in the real world working for them, they're just going to be like, wow, I can just buy more elephants and, and, and eat the dip. And you constantly see this. We have tons of drawdowns where you can zoom in on that chart and see where BNB has taken a dump and uh, motivated buyers have stepped in to, to eat the price because a week ago, the price was... 15% cheaper. A month, uh, 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 a month and a half ago, the price was 100% cheaper. And as we go deeper into that, um, as we go, as time progresses on, we're going to oscillate between 80% and 90% max, right? It can't go more than 90% um, in terms of like the price increases that we're going to see. Um, day to day, day over day. We're gonna see price increases day over day, which will naturally hit 5%, 10% and more. So there's gonna be a lot of volatility. So I think, I think the real question you're asking is like, what happens when we get closer to 90%? What happens when we go really vertical? Cause that's, that day is gonna come and it's, it's gonna come pretty fast. You're gonna to see tons of intraday volatility and you're going to see a distribution of this token to more people. And as you get a, a bigger distribution of more people, as early holders take profit, for people who are motivated like you, because, you know, when I listen to your, your video, you're like, well, okay, I'm going to participate, but I'm just going to get in and get out. For people with that mindset, they're going to have that opportunity. And we're going to continue to grow and expand because we have this strong base of people that are already rich. That are that are trying to acquire more of an asset that's been beating 
elephant. And it's not just based on... Now, if you want to talk about Hex, Hex was a flawed contract, but it was the first contract to be promoted at the level that Richard Hart promoted. Richard Hart is a promoter. He is clearly not me, but he is a promoter. He does his thing really well. I do my thing really well. All right? So he has a super huge community because he's a... a, a, a interesting promoter and i have the community that i have because we've just more focused on the long haul and actually literally just engineering something for the long haul and so because of that you have a different result at the end of the day you have a different result arguably we've, we've been competing against hex as well and we're still around really good points <laughs> uh, if I could just add to that too, uh, Gerhard, um, you know, one of the differences between us and Hex or anything else, like I said in the beginning, is the fact of we have a known whale in the system named Bertha who does not dump on you. And remember, she pays out all the liabilities. So as we squeeze the supply, remember, these LPs are shrinking. And everything that BT said, the price action is a function of how low we get these elephant tokens out of the LPs. That's what this predictive chart was I just showed you before. Right now we're at 82 trillion. We're right here on the chart, which means we're at 57 cents per 1 million elephant tokens. We're right here. And in the last seven days, we have dropped the trillions by 6.4 trillion. That is from Bertha buying it. That is from users buying it, from minting of NFTs, from future deposit, everything, right? And we're going to keep climbing down this. Now, here's one more aspect we didn't even get into. EMH... Wasn't able to make this call, but um, we've got a multiplicative effect happening, okay? So all the incoming money that enters this ecosystem is harnessed again by the protocol, by Bertha growing. Here, here's just an example of, of Bertha, right? This is with BNB price at $208, whatever it is today. If $535 comes into this ecosystem, don't get scared off by all these numbers. This is just with the pooled WBNB, an elephant token, but here's the price per million at the time of this math, 0 0.49847. Then $535 comes in. It changes to 0.49849. So seven turns to nine. That tiny, tiny incremental price appreciation spread out across Bertha's token count. You get the whale economics. And I see Mike Dre's in here. I don't know if he could step in. But that what Bertha does the friendly whale in the system does. She takes $535 and she literally gained a value of $4,500. This is that FOMO multiplier that BT alluded to earlier. 8.5X is what she did to that money. This is the same reason why Elon Musk with his 455 million shares of Tesla, if the Tesla price goes up by $2, Elon Musk himself sees like a billion dollars it's whale economics. That's mm. what's happening here because of this, this, uh, this protocol, this Bertha, this whale. Hex doesn't have this. Nothing else in crypto you have seen has a Bertha. It's kind of like the Avengers said, uh, we could beat anyone. We've got a Hulk. Mm. Bro, okay. we've got a Bertha. Nobody let, has that. Let me be devil's advocate again. Um, the Bertha currently has 100 million worth of the token, right? Um, if... 3 million of that 100 million were to hit the liquidity pools today, the price would go down by roughly 20%. So if I would be very, um, uh, uh, very frank with this, um, this is you holding your own token in the treasury, which is the same thing we have seen. I'm not very, very straightforward. The same thing we have seen with FTT and FTX. Right. So um, the value that is there in, in Bertha with the 100 million is definitely inflated because you can't liquidate those 100 million to become 100 million worth of wrapped BNB or wrapped BUSD. It works both, uh, in both directions. Uh, so the liabilities... Not not okay, go ahead. But, but not quite because... Um, and I was, just, I was actually just thinking about this, uh, thinking about your question, where, where it's going, I think it's going. But we have dual liquidity pools. So when, and, and also, you know, like you say, 3 million. 3 million in sales could happen, but it's not going to happen from Bertha. Bertha has 
is is controlled by governance contracts, you know, Luna and all that stuff. That was because of a flaw in their design. It was because they were forced to sell, right? Because of an exploit. So we're past that point. We've we've engineered the uh, exploit potential out of the treasury dumping those tokens. But the the the, uh, the maximum amount of tokens that the treasury will, will ever pay out is its daily liabilities. So we're basically uh, our daily liabilities around 70, 80, let's just say 80,000. 80,000 is our daily liabilities. We're doing daily volume of, you know, you know, approaching a million dollars. And that's going to increase as we increase adoption. Uh, but like, it's, it's really that the maximum amount that's going to come out of Bertha is going to be significantly less than the positive daily volume of just doing business right so you have a you have a profitable business if you're making you know ideally money every day if you're making pot if, if you're if your cash if your net cash flow is positive every day you have a very you have a profitable business at the end of the day if you have a if you have negative cash flow day to day then you have a losing business and you're going to go out of business so um we have to, with, with product market fit, we have to assume that we have a business that at a minimum has net positive cash flow. That's the definition of a profitable business. If we have net positive cash flow, that means that we have net positive volume. If we have net positive volume, it means price go, go up. And that's why we get those daily, day over day trending, you know, 1% to 2% now, it seems, every day. That's that's what's going on. But also when we do have to sell our daily liabilities from Bertha, when we sell, it's gonna ping pong between those two LPs and the system's tuned to get to give the best price to, to not only Bertha, but to all the other participants that use the tools directly. Even if you use the pancake swap independently, you're gonna get the best price from those LPs. So what happens is the average price intraday is the average between the, the price that's in the BNB backed LP versus the BUSD LP. So when we sell against one, the, the price is between those two, right? The price is between those two. And so the, the buyer, net buyers coming in, they're going, or, and even sellers, sellers are gonna hit the, the, the LP that's higher. Um, buyers are gonna hit the LP that's lower. But we're going to have arbitrage and load balancing between those two. And so in practice, what happens is, especially since B&B is so ruggy, the BOSD LP holds up the price. It's like, our, it's, like, it's like jacking up a car. You can use the lever. I, I, I describe it as akin to a lever. Speculative assets, it's like you're using a counter lever um, and you have to pull down on that pole to lift up the... The vehicle and you have to keep on applying that pressure the moment that pressure stops you fall in a million dollars for us for so so spec that's a speculative asset but but when you're talking about prices that are backed by a liquidity pool it's more like a jack whatever whatever that ratio is that's fixed in time in that point in time that's the price it's not speculative it's determined by the ratio of those two things and so we can use the fact that we have the stablecoin BUSD to sort of prop up our progress as we ascend in price, even with um, BNB um, having volatility. And then, like I said before, we have those motivated, motivated buyers who want to, you know, you know, people are constantly coming in and they want to get the best price. So they're always going to be balancing that back up to, to the backstop, which is the BUSD LP. So we, we, we have that in place as well. It's a lot of thermodynamics going on. Okay, so to prop up the price in any of those liquidity pools, you need the other side besides the elephant token, right? Just because you hold a lot of elephant tokens doesn't mean you can improve the ratio of, say, BUSD to elephant or rep BNB to elephant, right? You need BUSD or rep BNB to prop up that ratio. So ideally you've yes. got this, so either yearly you have either stored some for bad times or you've got some delayed purchases through some products or you are reliant on new people uh, buying your new products. 
And if the last is the, the case, then of course this is the most of the, the, the riskiest, I would say, of the uh, potential ways to prop up the price further. If you've got yeah. some kind of balance somewhere of BUSD or Rep BNB, this would be less risky. Or if you've got some uh, product that makes people continue to purchase similar to um, your staking product, as I understand. But the yeah, more you've got of that, the, the better. Right. It, it, is, it is definitely the case that the staking product, you know, has good product market fit and, and, and provides a, a baseline. Because the other thing is, in terms of the retained funds, the 90% that's put into the BUSD treasury, 50% of that is used intraday, right? And so, like, ideally that thing would, if, if we didn't get any new funds coming in, you would see that thing, you know, whittled down to zero, having every day. But it stays above 100K because of the product market fit and because there's always new people coming in and because, more importantly, there's continued utilization day over day, week over week, depending on people's reinvestment schedule. So people are using this thing. You have to think about, like, you know, if you have a savings account and say you just have a job, that savings account is going to get hit every two weeks. You know, you're going to get paid from your job, but you know, and there, there might be some transaction fee. So they're going to pick up some transaction fee, but more importantly, they're going to take on your deposits and use them however they see fit. Right. A bank takes your deposit, uses it however they, you, they see fit. In our case, we, we don't use your investment as, as we see fit. It's, it's basically hard coded to do the buybacks on this elephant token asset. So like there's there's a so there's a base level of, of utilization that's that's happening because it is a savings account. It is it is a replacement for a savings account. That's so that's what's determining that heartbeat in that do we have a chart on do we have a chart on the inflows in aggregate of all the savings accounts of all the people using the staking? We yeah, do, we do, we do, we do. Do you have that? Um, I saw a version of that from Flourish, I think, that Stu put together. But I don't know if I don't know if uh, I don't know if Dayla, uh, uh, has this here. But I know oh, Stu. Has. Mm. It was like solid colors. It was, and it just had all, all the different inputs. I don't oh, think no, it's I, here. I haven't seen that. No. It's in the ch it was posted in the chat. Okay, uh, quest question. So just to understand, I'm not sure if I understand oh, uh, actually, that part already. Got it. Um, oh, uh -huh. when you get it, that's great. So um, currently, right, there's like 130K or whatever, or 140K in the BUSD treasury. Half of that gets used to buy the elephant token. Would that in turn mean that it's roughly 70K right now that's flowing into the staking program a day? It's it's completely variable. Am I still? Yeah. Am I? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's 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 variable. We have we have some spiky days. We have some less than spiky days. But yeah. let's see. I'm like an to... average over a week or a month would be interesting. Yeah. Like here, here's one chart you can see on, on my screen. Uh, Gerhard, uh, daily deposits is denoted yeah. in these green, but you, you have some spiky days, like right? right? Like mm -hmm. I think this one really big green one is that image I captured right here. Remember I told you 518,000 oh, came okay. in. Yeah. That's captured right here, but then you can just kind of see the average of what's happening here. Like this day, look at my tooltip, 70,000, 44,000, uh, 50,000, 107,000. So it, it varies day by day, but yes, money is always coming into the futures. Okay, trying to get that chart. There we go. Okay, we've also got the aggregate, so that's good. Total deposits, total withdrawals as well. Yeah, that's I'll pull that. So you, you see total withdrawals. So Total withdrawals, now you see it red. I just clicked it on. That's how many withdrawals are happening. Mm -hmm. Yep, total compound. So, I mean, yeah, Dune is pretty amazing. Definitely. I love Dune. But they've changed to V2. 
V1 was so much easier to use. Oh, no. I was no. I was like writing some some dashboards in hot times with Dune. Um, oh, but now they, yeah, yeah, with Horde. Yeah. But now they've they've changed everything to V2. You have to relearn everything. Uh, so I dropped this Dune link inside of there inside of your thank main you. general chat. Yep. Thank you. And then um, another interesting chart though. Is, that, is one more right question. Here. Yeah. So oh, one more yeah. question. So all of 100% of that staking money is getting uh, into the elephant money purchases, uh, into the, the elephant token purchases afterwards, just with that delay. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, 90% of all. So if you put in 100K right now, yeah. 90K of that will hit the BUSD treasury. The mm -hmm. other 10%, 10K will go into the buffer pool, which just kind of handles some of the daily one-off liabilities. Yeah. But... But yes, everything uh, that goes into this BUSD treasury, 100% of it buys Elephant Token exclusively for, for Bertha. And that's kind of, it's kind of like a double moving average almost, right? So you've got half of the treasury gets purchased per day, but then there's also the buffer pool that makes smaller purchases less, uh, less right. frequently hitting it's the pool. It's just insulation. It's insulation for Bertha. So if like you claim out $5,000, well, Bertha shouldn't have to sell five thousand dollars if it can just come right out of this buffer pool. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Okay. Yep. Interesting. I didn't okay. To do yeah, this is very interesting, especially with the numbers. So we can kind of see um, how this recurring money inflow stream is developing because this is an inflow stream that is pretty constant, right? So when you look at the deposits of this on this deposit chart we've just seen, I like charts like this. Right, because yeah. I can see, uh, I can see there's no fluctuation in there, and I can then also put this into relationship to how much the elephant price is being supported by that. You can then also put this into relationship to what potential sell pressure there might be. Um, Correct. Hey, Mike Dre, I think you got a mute, brother. Mike Dre, I will um, take uh, done. Mute him. Okay. Yeah. This is interesting. Okay. You want to show me another chart? Um, yeah, I was gonna yeah, Mike Dre can't hear. You, you don't have a way of muting him, do you, Gerhard? Uh, <laughs> I I mute, oh I just I just muted, muted him there on my side. Um I press right click and mute, but that seems to be only oh, server only mute. Is it server mute? I, I press server mute. Let's see if that works. Is he muted for you? Uh, I don't know. I just muted yeah. him personally anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah, there sure. you go. <laughs> Server mute. Okay. Okay. No, wonderful. Now, just quickly, this, this chart, Gerhard, it, specifically about futures, it came out at the end of January, and you'll see on my tooltip, okay, I'm just going to fast forward, but um, we've had, thir oh, wow, we've had $13 million. I'm used to saying 12. We've had $13 million come in truly as futures deposits that, think about that, all of that bought elephant token and essentially mm -hmm. put it into Bertha. And the TVL now is the debt we owe, so 18 million. So people have compounded up. We owe a debt ultimately of 18 million. But in that same time period, the treasury growth, uh, just interestingly, I wanted to point out, grew almost 90 million yeah, off of that 12 million deposit. I, I, I'm a bit cautious with the treasury growth, right? Because as said, once the treasury sells, the value will not hey, come out as denominated. It's treasury there, growth in the... elephant money. It's not treasury okay. growth de denominated okay. in rep BNB. SK, SK, just just go to the chart to the right. That's the chart you want. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. This one right here. Yeah. So it's our liabilities. Is our liabilities as a percentage of the treasury are dropping. Yes. So basically, as the, the the liabilities are on a different growth trajectory. You know, they only can do, uh, our liabilities can only maximum do uh, 5x, and not everybody's pushing the pedal to the metal. To do a 5x, you got to be compounding like every day. Most people compound every week, which is like a 4x. Um, so, and then they, and then people are claiming because at the end of the day, this is utility. So you build it to a certain point, and then you're claiming to pay your daily liabilities yourself. So the bottom line is, and when you claim your daily liabilities, the overall liabilities of the system go down. So birth is starting to go.
Is it just me or did we uh, lose connection? Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought it was just me. I was like, no, <laughs> did I lose internet? Yeah. All right. BK, we, you cut out. We lost you. But well, what he's trying to explain is you see this yellow line. So as we're growing the yellow line with the daily liabilities in blue, the the the, the percentage, the, the ratio yeah. of... Yeah, you see how we've reversed recently. Yes, the yellow line. Wait, so, which is, this which is great. Uh, yes. Which is great, but the problem is that um, unless people claim their um, their liabilities to buy NFTs, if they actually claim their liabilities to hit the liquidity pools to sell Elephant Token, then again, we can't take the treasury's value um, as it, at its value, right? Because as said, uh, you don't need to sell that many tokens in order to depress the price much. I haven't done the math. But if you were to liquidate all of those treasury tokens, who knows if it would, um, what would happen? Let me see if I have another chart. Okay, no, I don't. Are we talking no, no, here no, no, about, I, I what treasury are we talking here about? Sorry, maybe I'm talking, maybe I'm mixing things up. This treasury that's shown here in Dune, what treasury is this? Is this the, bio, this is the, the elephant treasury, right? Uh, in Dune, this is the size of the elephant treasury, yes, and as yeah, a percentage against exactly. daily liabilities. Yeah, yes, so it's shrinking. Problem. But but think back real quick to that multiplicative math I told you about and the hodl value, the hodled value of 535 turning into 4,500. That, in another way to look at it, is on this chart. So but it turns the other way around as well, right? People exit, then you get no, the multiplier effect no. down. But, but we don't owe them as fast as the money coming in. So look at this. Remember, $200 is used to compound inside of a futures account. And the bigger that the elephant treasury Bertha gets, she's multiplying what that 200 feels like to her, right? So she's 4xing, 7xing. $200 is being turned into multiple thousands in her bag. Now, just like I described before, remember, this person gave $2.5 to the treasury but by the time she owes five hundred eighteen thousand back she doesn't sell 2.5 trillion she sells a magnitude an order of magnitude less she just sells less tokens to meet the daily or whatever dollar obligation that's what's happening here and that's what's being represented by you know these charts so i mean you you're on the right path but i think you got to look at you know everything together what's happening with the multiplicative effect And sorry, okay. I just had a baby walk into the room, so everyone's got babies. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um Okay. I I think I think what you're looking for is are you early or not? And once again, that gets back to the I'm looking for the, the risk. I'm looking for the risk because there is always risk in everything. Right? Of course. I mean, are you are you really like like okay? So I'm looking. So the skeptics, the skeptics, the the people that look at this and that have been burnt ten times, most of them won't of even won't even watch any video on something like this, anyways. But the people that do, that are still skeptic and that are on the fence, they are looking for what could happen. Okay, if rep BNB price might drop, and this might have some implications on some elephant money sales, but when That's something. The yeah, I am that not sure really about different. that. I am so that is the thing where we where, where we disagree very likely. I can't pin it down yet. Um, we've survived. We've survived the fifty percent drop in in the price of B and B over the course of uh, over over the course of uh, a year and a half. Yeah, and and the other the other thing that's going to happen is as we 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 own over four percent of the circulating supply of rat B and B. Basically, the BNB used to as TVL and DeFi right now. What happens when we get to double digits? Just like you noticed that it only takes one percent. I'm oh, sorry, it only takes one sixth of the participation in futures to really start to drive that heartbeat and, and make it so that we move to net positive no. uh, volume. No. Are the you, same thing goes no. for controlling the circulating supply of BNB. We will start to squeeze. We are squeezing BNB right off, now. Off again, so we have baseline. Um, this one over six, right? The, yeah. the, so six, or, or yeah, one over six people being in NFTs or in staking. 
Over what time frame is that? Because obviously NFTs have gone up quite a bit in the recent with the recent sales. Is that including all yep. of those sales? Is this over a lifetime? Is this what is this relating to? Do you know? Including everything um, right now, you know, right right now. Okay, so the no, recent in recent past it should grow. be even a better ratio, I imagine. Because most of the sales of NFTs happened just recently. So if you just look like at the ratio in the last two months, two months. it's probably even yeah, better. Yeah, so it's 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 even better. But like but I, I'm just saying, you know, conservatively speaking, you know, these 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 numbers are th those sort of numbers are gonna only increase. Like people are gonna start to use more, you know, as as we get to the profit taking range. People will start to use more of the he's, ecosystem. He's, uh, he's, um, like you can, you can de risk the ETH. You can de risk into ETH. Sorry, I had to Somebody mute one of your colleagues. Yeah, I had to call. I had to mute uh, AS yield by. Maybe he messages you when okay. when he wants to get uh, unmuted again. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um. He, as people get into the take profit range they'll naturally diversify uh, into the uh, ecosystem. More than likely, um, you know, they can de-risk into B to BTC, ETH, you know, the standard blue chips uh, through, through our trunk farms. So they can, and those trunk farms are 100% renounced. They run completely independently of everything. So like that, that's the way for us to sort of maintain the TVL. But people for, to also de-risk. But then again, you know, de-risking into, you know, lower performing assets, it's just going to be interesting. We, we're in uncharted territory. So, um, but but operationally speaking, like we have a complete systems diagram for um, how, how this system works. Uh, let me let me just post this just just so you understand that. Most most projects that we're competing against are maybe a dozen a dozen you know serious contracts max. You know you you have some things like Ave and stuff like that. You know they, they may they may they may have more uh, contracts uh, just in terms of like proper you know um, proper engineering to to have the you know smaller building blocks. But when you really talk about functionally speaking. Um, you know, these system diagrams are not that big. It's not that complicated. But but here we have a complete uh, bank of a complete organ, you know, down to the department levels on chain. So that's why we have we literally have 51 contracts working together in a symphony. Um, and it really is uh, the flow of money within the ecosystem uh, uh, that allows a lot of this magic to happen. Um, I just want to give you. I just want to, you know, so so, so SK can post this. Uh, see, uh, here it is, right here. Copy this link. So I'm just putting this in the, or I shall send it to you, SK. Yeah, sure. Direct. Here it is, paste. So that's just the whole systems diagram for the whole thing. All right, I'm gonna open it now. Whoa. Now, how do I zoom in on that? Jeez. Oh, okay. I'm zoomed in, BT. Any particular part you want to look at? Jeez. This is amazing. Well, we can, I mean, if you could post the link, if you can post the link in his his general chat as well, you know, people can look at it in their own time. You know, uh, we're 100 percent transparent. Right. You know, Tesla, Tesla is not posting the system diagrams for the Model 3, but we are. So, you know. Ultimately, the way that this gets like w we personally think. That this system. I mean, it. it that the, that's outperformed Bitcoin for the past couple of years. This isn't going to be the only version of this system. Like, you know, people will try to copy it. They will, you know, th there's going to be other things that come out after this. 
this is just the first one. And, you know, you know, hopefully we, we, we have the a leadership position. We'll provide a safe place for people to park their funds. But, you know, we expect, you know, we expect this to get this, this, this way of doing things to proliferate and to, and to lead to better ideas. You know, like I didn't come up with all these ideas. You know, this heavily, heavily leverages, you know, Uniswap V2 architecture, top and bottom. Everything about the way Uniswap V2 works, you know, I've exploited that to achieve a goal of cash flow for all. I've exploited the engineering. I've exploited the mathematics. I use time delays. I, it's literally called, um, the term we use is, is, you know, everybody has a time horizon. You know, everybody has a different financial goal. Some people are trying to get rich. Some people are already rich. Some people are wealthy. Some people are filthy rich and wealthy. You know, they all have different goals for the system. Some people just want the, the, the least amount of risk possible, right? You know, some people can throw down a $100,000 stack. The majority of people are doing what? 7,500. So 7,500 is very easy for the system to manage. It means that the majority of people can't, you know, bring down the system in one fell swoop because the, the average user is not that big. It, it, it's not $100,000, it's, it's $7,500. So, um, so this is, you know, if you look at this diagram, realize that this wasn't built overnight. It wasn't designed overnight. It's like city planning. It's like doing the designing the sewers for, for, for a city um, and having that grow organically over time and solving problem, problems as they come, right? So there's lots of lessons to be learned and a lot of those are those lessons are baked right into this diagram that you see. So this is the entire system. It's everything that it does, um, simplified in in the most concise way for the majority of people to understand, right? So, um, so you know, it's is it okay to miss the boat? I say yes. It's it's okay to miss the boat, but if you zoom out and look at the chart, you know the. There's been lots of opportunities to jump in with where things were fairly stable. We were building liquidity. We didn't have all the products out. I mean, there was lots of places, lots of opportunities to get in. And to be honest, I beg people to get in at $1,000 per trillion. I beg people to get in at $3,000 per trillion. I think at $15,000 per trillion, I stopped telling, I stopped, you know, asking people to get in, you know, I was like, people are going to get in if they get in. They're not going to get in if they don't, don't want to get in. People are going to do what they want to do. So, um, and, and my job is just to teach two things, each one, teach one DCA, that's it. And we're, and, and, and we're, and that we're doing this together through thick and thin. And, the, and that really is it. Like, um, and risk wise, you know, we've been fighting, this isn't even a risk. It's, it's, it's a known fact. We've been fighting this brutal bear market this whole time. We've been fighting, you know, B and B rugging us all the time, you know. So, um, we'd be a lot higher if if B and B, you know, was a uh, like one of the things I wish was that you know we built the whole system on a stable coin that wasn't going to disappear. Like I still have to solve the BUSD problem. It's not a big problem, but I do have to solve it. And it, there's a area of solution in place. We're going to be working working with Chainlink. But we're going to be take we're going to sort of be like surgically removing BUSD from the ecosystem, and luckily that's a fairly easy exercise. You know, it's just going to nat be able to naturally happen. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have the system just point to WBNB. There'll be natural arbitrage uh, for for the futures product. We'll just we'll use Chainlink to get the the price of BNB. And then you know you'll 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 you, you'll do B and B in and out, and you'll just get credited in cash. You'll get credited USD value. So you still have to put in two hundred dollars, but it'll be two hundred dollars worth of B and B. Yeah, uh, whatever your available divs are, you'll just get paid out in B and B. So pretty easy there. So th those are th that's that's work that we'll be working on finishing up for the end of the year. And when I see when I say we, I mean me. I, I, I got to code it up and 
That's, that's the work that I have to do. All right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I think most of my questions are answered. We've already been run for quite a while now. Um, I'm not sure we should continue. I mean, there's uh, some people here in the call. Not everybody is directly closely tied to elephant money. If anybody else has questions, you can also raise it here. Um, I think yeah. for me, I'm I'm good. I will dig a bit deeper into some transactions. I will have a look at some balances. Uh, we'll try to dive into this 51 contract complex. Um, I yeah. am still not 100% convinced that BNB is here the main risk because you are introducing a lot of expectations uh, with the compounding and the price appreciation um, that need to be met. And the question is, um, is there a point where, is there a minimum required growth of adoption to meet those expectations, those high expectations, right? If you are just flatlining in growth, which I don't say you will, but if there is a point at which you will not grow as quickly anymore as expectations are growing, I could see this as an issue, but I cannot yet point down where exactly um, the stress will fall on the system. Um, but I definitely want to thank you for all the time. I want to thank you for all the charts. I will have a look at a lot of Dune dashboards, a lot of queries. Feel free to also share more data as you, um, yeah, yeah, as you're here, right? So you can simply just post this in the general chat or alternatively also in Telegram. And um, yeah, I will try to make sense out of this as much as I can. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, the way I would summarize it is, I'll tell you this, I'm not, I'm not a financial advisor. Uh, but I have been in industry a long time and I've been an investor a long time. The, the way, the way that you approach this is you take, uh, like any other asset or any other opportunity, you take a, a, you know, based on your own financial goals, you take a, a risk adjusted, um, you, you, you size, you size your, your participation in a risk adjusted manner. And so, you know. You should only use risk capital. You should uh, not bet the whole farm for, for sure. And people should just simply, you know, get just get in with it. Could be a hundred dollars. It could be a thousand dollars. It could be ten thousand dollars. It just depends on your level of risk. Your, your, you know, how much you're 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 willing to bring to the table. And you can just start to participate in a certain way to, you know, because sometimes you just have to be in it just to appreciate it. You have to actually see those those two percent rises day over day uh, to to get an understanding. And you know we you know we we encourage everybody to do their own research. But you know while you're learning, you know getting a little bit of the token, whatever that number is, that's the best way to just you know participate in something that at least by the chart has never been done before and is very special, especially the recovery, especially the rallying of the community. This, this is not just code, but it's the community effort. And, and at the end of the day, this chart only goes up based on community participation and volume. So realize that this is happening because the elephant community wants it to happen. If the elephant community collectively does not want this chart to go up, it will not go up. So at the end of the day, in the simplest way to describe what we're doing, it's a financial cooperative. The code's been designed so that we can all work together and, and focus our efforts. But ultimately, it's the will of the community and them bringing their capital to the table, which makes this chart go up and which attracts additional investment. The one, the one feedback that I've gotten from everyone, especially the larger whales, um, that we've met, you know, SK has been doing a great job of introducing us to uh, larger participants, more sophisticated participants. And the number one thing they said is, most projects we simply cannot participate in because we'll just crush it. We can't throw our money in. If, if we throw our money in, we're exit liquidity. This project is right size for 
our risk capital. This project is is attracting our capital because it's big enough and because it's locked the, the basic bread and butter things like the locked liquidity. Um, the fact that the tokens haven't changed since the launch, those are the things that the whales care about. And they, they simply and, and we simply wouldn't have gotten there if the community didn't want us to grow to the size where we could uh, accommodate these new participants. So that trend will just rise. You know, money, money attracts more capital and investment. And so the larger we get, the more the Lindy effect kicks in, the more, the, the more we become that store of value by simply, you know, outlasting others and, you know, getting past things like the exploit and things like that and getting these larger participants and more distribution of the token. So that, that, that's my last, um, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for having SK and everybody. And it's been great. Thank you. I will um, use some excerpts for this for a video, probably. I will also, if you don't mind, share the whole thing, like on a side note on the channel as well, for people that want to watch the whole thing. Probably not everyone want to do this, but I just want to let you know, I'll uh, share the whole thing. So that, right, for transparency's sake. Yeah, um, you, you, uh, you, you at least have my permission, and I'm sure SK doesn't have a problem. You know, you feel free to share the whole thing, and then yeah. um, share... Uh, you know, a more concise version as well. Top. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. All right. Hey, Gerhard, appreciate you, man. Um, also, as you do your research, I know you're going to have more questions. Um, I've DM'd you here on Discord. If this is your mm -hmm. primary way to get in touch, feel free, brother. Hit me yeah. up anytime with anything. And uh, if you need to talk to BT, I'll link you. But uh, yeah, yeah, just check your DMs. And thank you so much, man. You, you've been so accessible, so understanding, really good questions. I just wanted to thank you for what you do. Appreciate it.